Hello there, and welcome back to The Disconnected. I am here with Howard S. Berger that I've been wanting to finally have this conversation with for months at this point. Howard, thank you for finding some free time in your <laughs> uberly busy schedule to get this done. It's a blessing. Let's just keep it that way. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather you keep chasing me down and knows I'm paying rent. There, there's not, I, I think lately, not a week or two goes by that I'm not reading your name off for special features for something on my live show. Uh, you, you were just insanely busy lately. How's, how's everything yeah. been? It's good. I got really, I, it's good. well, I mean, you, cal- you can't, you can't complain when you're doing this. I mean, like, you know, I don't, I mean, you can, you know, when you have a stroke from no sleep from a, for a month and, but you know, uh, it's where it's great. And, and the people who are, you know, I'm, I'm working for and working with, you know, it's, it's better than any, you know, certainly better than any, you know, college class I ever took back in the day. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> right. And I had some good ones. So, uh, no, really, really uh, good. I'm speak. grateful that you're using the second line here to, to display that you're a director, editor, video essayist, and that's just the beginning. I mean, the, the amount of stuff that it seems like you've touched is Getting to be a little daunting at this point, and over the last couple, uh, I've been about ten days trying to rewatch as many. If of If you're the trying Howard- to get into my will, I mean, I'll put you in it. No. It's worth nothing. None of this is going to make it worth. <laughs> uh, but I'll, you're in it. Uh, you're in my will. Maybe I can get that and- Adamson set eventually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, oh no, that's that's for my burial. That pays for the burial. Okay, <laughs> I'll talk about it. I, I, I mean, in all reality, I just wanted to say it's been no, thank you. so interesting to to listen and track down to what you have been a part of over the last few years. Because many of these people that do the commentaries, the video essays, everybody has their specialties. And you, in my opinion, are one of the more well-rounded individuals that do these. You've got expertise in so many different genres. Like, where where did that foundation come from for you? Thank you. That's nice of you. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's worthless. I'm telling you. That it's not. I can't promise much. Um, I have to say, uh, I've been really lucky with like my family. Uh, we, were, I was born and raised at a time when uh, my family. It's, I just have my mom, my dad, my had my grandmother who was living with this time. They're gone now, all of them, unfortunately. Uh, but I had two sisters, two older sisters. And we moved out from, I think my, my, my mom, my dad, they were getting a little nervous uh, where we were living in Queens, New York, where there was, the, we were right in the pe- flight path of like, you know, the, the airline, the, the, the planes landing, it right. was like, I don't know, JFK or LaGuardia or something like that. But um, it, the, the planes would fly 150 feet over the, the building that my, my parents were living in. And uh, they said, we're going, we, we, we got to get out of here. We're going to go to Long Island, my dad was a pharmacist, but he bought a store or whatever, of course, three hours away. But uh, <laughs> and he was just like, and he was a guy who wanted a family. Like but he, you know, he regretted having to go to work. He wanted to be a dad and he was great. He was wow. sugar. The man was beautiful. And my mom, same thing. My mom was a little feisty. Uh, you know, I, she was, she was a ball of fire, but, um, they were such great people. Like my friends considered them friends and, um, and it wasn't like they were like close to my age. They weren't, I was, I was a virus. My mom didn't expect me at all. Like I was the third kid. She didn't want me. So my right. dad was like, Oh God, I have to add, I got to work another, you know, 2000 hours a week for this creature. So, uh, we, they moved out to long Island and it was mid sixties and, all there was <laughs> at that point were movie theaters coming up. And, you know, we, instead of whenever we weren't just doing something, you know, arts and craftsy or whatever, my mom, my dad, my sisters, my grandmother, we all go to another movie. And there were thousands of films wow. coming out. And my parents didn't understand or give a crap about ratings when they came out finally because we we were seeing a lot of stuff before ratings didn't come out until like you know the late 60 68 right. 69 and we were going you know to to everything uh because you could go to everything and tv was like you know you know eh, black and white we only have a black and white set i think it's a you know we don't even have a den yet and it was like you know just tv stuff we were watching we, we like tv too but I, I for some reason when i was 
I mean, I remember seeing movies when I was the, the, the seat that I was sitting in in the theater was my mom or dad's lap. Like oh. that's that's how, and, and I was gl- glued immediately. I don't know. My mom said used to tell me that, um, like both my other sisters, they were like uh, my oldest sisters, who is brilliant. I mean, they're both brilliant, but one is like Krell level, and uh, always intimidated me from the, the get go. And uh, she was just extre- she her grasp of every kind of language was amazing i mean like not not foreign languages but like right. literature or film from uh-huh. the so i was like in awe so i was sort of like secretly in competition to try and get her attention and my parent like my parents attention and i loved movies my mom said i was i was the only one talking at like 9 months <laughs> great um and and my sister was my sister oldest sister wasn't she didn't talk for like three years you know but figures she didn't have to she was having great conversations probably you know <laughs> dissertations in her head she was so genius so by the time they um you know i i was i was just she said the bassinet not bassinet the uh, p- playpen doing laundry when we were still living in queens right in front of a tv set down in the laundry room they had one and that's it. She said I'd be standing, trying to stabilize my fat little legs to so that I'd be there watching anything on TV. As I got older, uh, it was immediate towards late 60s. I wasn't even like maybe four, three and a half, wow. four. I was trying to figure out ways, contrive ways to stay awake um, <laughs> so that I'd watch movies when i found out that movies were on after thanks grandma she was the one who told me uh <laughs> movies are on like oh, like until like four o'clock in the morning and then the test patterns would come on yeah uh i manipulated like crazy so that i could watch <laughs> movies so if you're saying you know it this didn't come from classrooms i didn't discover movies late i was I was watching, I mean, except for the older ones, but who knew? The thing is, back when I was watching movies as a, as a kid, it, 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 was, it was a younger time in between movies than Star Wars is to us now, like the first one. That's older now than what I was. Right. Wa- I was watching Jimmy Cagney movies, and just because that's what it was, it was like 35 years old or 40 years old. You look, but the back in the 20th century, this is weird you could talk like this, but you really can, things didn't look the same. Every 10 years, there was a dramatic cultural shift. So yep. everything looked different. The style of cars, the style of buildings, the style of clothes, the style of, uh, you know, the different types of relationships and politics and acting styles and set design and cinematography. It was all different. Oh, yeah. Now, you don't, you know, you don't really know from like maybe 1998 or nine to now, it's a little tougher, you know, a little tougher. But um, so back then I was just galumping stuff down and we had stuff in New York. Uh, I mean, we were in Long Island, but it was New York had this great uh, channel, uh, 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 WOR9. And every day, I think it was like 11 o'clock in the afternoon, I think, or maybe one o'clock. I don't remember that well anymore. Uh, maybe five years ago I did, but they would. And then at eight o'clock at night, every day would be the million dollar movie. And that would be one film every single day for a week. So I was watching stuff like, um, red skeleton in the, uh, fuller brush man, which was paralyzingly brutal, funny comedy i mean brutal totally yeah. appealing to me i don't know why violence in comedy <laughs> really was important like i wanted brutality and that just sent me into hysterics so that that would be a, then king kong would be on Ooh. and i wouldn't know what these were you know i didn't know i had no idea but it, you know you go and then they had like son of kong for a week where i would just be crying hyperventilating for poor baby kong you know like things like that so every and if you watch if you watch three of my any of my pieces, it's always going to start the same way. When I was a little kid, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's, like, what's, it's not important unless it made a difference right. to me somehow. So, you know, working on the Sydney Fury thing, goddamn, 
I knew Sydney Fury since I was one. I was like an embryo. They pulled me out wet and was like, Sydney Fury is good. You know, I was like, <laughs> so, you know, th- that's, that's really how it happened. And my, my parents really encouraged us. I remember my mom, um, luckily this guy actually became my mentor and a, a, a good friend until he passed away was a man named Aram, Aram Avakian. Uh, some people have issues with him. It's okay. Like with the Godfather, if you know anything about the Godfather, there was some Michigas that went on because of him, but he, he was a brilliant guy and he made a, <laughs> he made a movie <laughs> called end of the road, which everybody worth his salt should know and have that scrim shot on his privates because that is the most amazing motion picture. 1969 with Gordon Willis is, I think his first feature as a cinematographer and Aram uh, from a John Barth book. So it's, it's this like sort of wonderful sort of collage film, sort of filmmaking, uh, very pop art at the time. And um, my mom was rated X mainly because I guess he had a guy fucking a chicken. Uh, okay. I might do it a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, I went over my head. I don't, I didn't get that. I just thought, I don't even remember it until I read about it later. And then I watched it. It was good. Um, crazy film, but he became a, my, te- my, my mentor and teacher when I did go to film school. And wow. um, he was a pisser. The guy was just wonderful. And uh, my mom, empty theater. And trying to explain to the, the manager of the theater, the owner of the theater, because he didn't want to get arrested for allowing, right. you know, a five-year-old and his mom into the theater. This is there. And he wasn't going to confront her and say why this is rated X. She didn't care about X. It didn't make any, it wasn't important. And she right. would, she always pulled out the same thing. We tried this with a couple of movies, including Clockwork Orange, also the same thing. We had the same, same issue. She goes, look. If he's old enough to ask to see it, shouldn't he be old enough to see it? And I'm with him. Right? Oh, I could just take yeah. him out. He let us in. You know, it's like that's wow. she would just you know. So um, that so it's really like you know uh, it was just trial by fire. I I I, I and, and what I liked was that films were different. They weren't yeah. all the same. And I wasn't looking for entertainment. After a while, after a while, I I just naturally. When I started seeing things uh, like subtext in movies, that happened early on, and I didn't know you weren't that people weren't looking for that. So I used to get in fights right. with people who love love this movie, love that movie, and hated this director, hated that. And I'm like, oh no, it's most this is most brilliant movie, a, a, a one that I'm having struggles with now for some reason. And it wasn't at least from in New York, it wasn't badly reviewed. A movie called was the the remake of King, the '76 remake of King Kong by John Gillerman. Now, yeah. uh, Gillerman's another one. I grew up with watching John Gillerman movies. You know, my mom <laughs> had one of her hoary crushes, you know, David Jansen and uh, Robert Mitchell. George Pappard was another one. And I had to deal with George Pappard. And I one of, one of the, v- the earlier movies that I remember going to see, which was a big deal for me because it, we had to travel, we had to drive, you know, I was driving like an hour to get to the theater, was the right. Blue Max now, wow. if you've never seen the Blue Max, that's another one that'll just blow your skull out of your skin. It, to, to, it's this three-hour epic, but it, you know everyone's yapping about, oh well, it's you know World War One flying. He says and the weather was bad in Ireland. You know all that crap, that like production crap, and then it's like, w- w- but it's all about fucking like wow, yeah. what? <laughs> this has nothing to do with a World War One flying ace. Right. Is no- wow, no, this is like really heavy, hoary stuff. And I'm like, this is it's insane. And then I started watching other John Gillerman movies just because we did, you know. But by the time you get to King Kong, it's like everyone's going like, this is not Kong, it's not stop motion animation. Right. All I know is that this is like one of the nastiest, darkest, like battle of the sex movies, satires from the 1970s I've ever seen. It's excoriating. It is so, and it's almost to the point of like misandrony. Like men are just despicable, controlling beasts, these monsters, and women are 100% victims. And 
it to me it was just very clear that Kong was this out of the blue creation from Jeff Bridges' head, who the minute he sees this woman sees a, an, an opportunity to be her her rescuer, right? It, from the from before before they knew about the Kong is when we were on the boat. And then you have this this unnatural thing go on where you know they cross this 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 fog bank that's never moved. <laughs> How cool is that? And they, they get and this monster comes out and takes her and he is going to be the guy to rescue her. So it's like this Freudian split. And how can you dismiss that? You can't see it in the first place and you can't just then you have to dismiss it because it's still a bad remake in their eyes of stop motion con there's room for both in my world i have no in fact one of the things i do when you know i i it, it, it i don't really care you know what happens but when i when i am asked to do like a, a with another person a, a, a audio commentary or something and i've either not worked with the person or if i'm doing my first rule is i abandon my taste because you know i'm not here I'm not here for you to agree or disagree with me. I'm right. here to tell you how I see stuff. And if you get it, that's good. Cool. If not, you know, then it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not judging you, but an opinion is not only an opinion. I love how people try and pretend it is not a, a power device because it's only a power to it's just to, it's just to start some you know uh i mean it has nothing to do with the movie it has to do with you like how many times yeah. did someone say that that film stinks or why you really like that movie really okay. and then 10 years oh you know i got around to watching it again after 10 years and i think it's really kind of holds up pretty it's pretty interesting i go oh really well how about the 20 people you just alienated in our circle exactly. by calling them morons so i i always tell someone you know if anyone does commentary with me i go uh the minute you judge it if i don't know about it ahead of time if it's, if it's used in a certain context fine but if if you start to to you know judge your movies i'll walk out of the session i just i'm done i have no well, I have no reason to be there otherwise you know I want kind of, that's what i've appreciated about your stuff is it's you know, we get a lot of the the historical context from a lot of these other commentators, and you do that plenty as well. But a lot of the stuff that you you bring to it is this, not to like sound like I'm you know worshiping or anything here, but like this <laughs> this this on. magical personal uh, context that means a lot in the moment, and you can sense that. Uh, and you you joked about the you know most of the time it starts with when I was little, but these stories that mean something to you, you can feel that that's something that yeah. people can't really make up oh that's nice to know believe me that's really great i appreciate that uh, you have no idea i mean i mean i mean that's the joy of it for me i don't right. i don't you know i the thing is i don't i don't care if people exactly <laughs> like me or like my taste it's so transitory i really don't care you know but if you've asked me to talk about a movie you know, and and it's amazing because you know there's a lot of people out there who um, they they get they get you know nasty, yeah. Uh, and I, I've been shocked by a few people that I really respected until they started um, literally trying to publicly humiliate me for uh. my uh, my take on movies. I mean, but I can support my take. Uh, because I'm not basing it on a, like a bias or a prejudice, you know, I'm not, I don't set, you know, limits. Now I do credit this with, um, with a collaborator of mine, uh, my, my friend, Kevin Marr, who are friends now. I don't want to say how long. Wow. Gets to that point where you go, <laughs> wow, I've known him more, you know, wow. Hello. A couple of years. Um, but he and I do, uh, we, we we actually brand ourselves the flying <laughs> the flying Magiste brothers, and we do a thing called Destructible Man uh, when we can. Now we used to be able to do it when we had lots of time. Now we have no time, but right. we're, we're going. We're trying to work it back into our our daily uh, thing and give us a couple of months. But um, where we 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 he would come over to my house. Um, he he lived you know about an hour away and be working um, his ass off on, you know, he was a museum, in, museum installationist, but he's also a brilliant, uh, film, you know, I, I knew him from film school, but not, he was, in, uh, he was after me, my grade. Right. I was ahead of him a little bit old, a year and a half older. So, um, I was introduced to him and suddenly we're like, we don't have to talk 
It's just like, you know, yeah. locked. And I, I never even had a friend like that growing up, you know. Uh, and, and so Kevin and I pretty much, you know, locked, uh, you know, very easily and stuff. Even if we didn't agree, it wasn't that. It never came to that. It was always this is what, how I see, this is how you see it. This is, and then, and then like, okay. So we, st- he used to come out on his, you know, if, if he, uh, he was freelancer, he would, he would have, you know, a month off or something like that. Uh, and until work came, he would, uh, he would come out to w- where I lived in Long Island and stay. And we would go to, we had a wonderful video store. Uh, the only one in Long Island that was just, Beyond, beyond was a, a place called One Twelve Video, and unfortunately, I just found out that um, I was I was really close friends for a good long time with the uh, owner of that store, uh, and he he was known for basically uh, uh, becoming a um, sort of like one of the first uh, like con- not not the first convention bootlegger, but he really had a good business. Like he actually paid the taxes. Right. Uh, you know, but he had a beautiful vision for what he wanted. And, um, and I saw this guy, Fred Fry, and he just passed away. Frighteningly enough, I, I couldn't believe that. So, um, uh, that was a big blow. I just found that out like this month. He died in January. Yeah. I had no clue, but he had disappeared and totally gotten out of the film thing. Uh, even though he's the guy, I'm sure he's one of the, probably one of the, like, 98% of the reason why, like, Vinegar Syndrome and all these, boot, you know, these these boutique labels are are dealing with some of these really yeah. esoteric titles. They probably originally bought them from Fred or from Video Search of <laughs> Miami at some point, where it looks like a Carillion photograph, like nine generations down, you know. But his store was amazing to go into. And, uh, you know, he just had like a, you know, he would, he would say, you know, uh, oh, well, give me, give me a list. Give me a list of stuff you're looking for. I said, well, don't say that. You know, I'll go home. I handed him like a 70 page list of titles. Wow. I just typed up for two days, just typing titles. And I just submitted like a list in his box, you know, and he would get everything, you know, and then wow. he had sections and he, and then he started going to Europe and buying the, the, the tapes, the PAL tapes and the CCAM tapes and bringing them back and transferring them to, and then subtitling nice. them himself. Yeah. And it was, and it was wonderful. And I mean, he, you, you could pretty much ask any of these more hardcore people and, and most of them probably would say, Oh yeah, it was his the thing was called luminous film and video works. And I, I named it because we were supposed to have done a, we were going to do a film together. You know, because he was, he, they, they just had like this. The, the Steadicam Junior came out, you know, for home video, whatever. So yeah. he wanted to do something and, uh, and you know, put money that he was making back into it. And he, uh, and we had no idea. We were we were writing the script and very genre land type of thing. You know, we were we were working on it and uh, we were just going to you know really try and do an authentic thing, but do it on Long Island. You know, not like look cheesy or like shot on right. video. We, we wanted to have a, a nice cinematic aesthetic to it, and. I remember the night that we we finished it and we typed up the title page with our names on the thing, and it was it was Howard Berger and and Fred Fry Berger and Fry, and I'm like <laughs> we didn't even realize and it both were spelled wrong you know Berger B E R G E R F R E Y, and we were just we couldn't even we were ready to throw up for the rest of the evening like laughing so hard it was just like. T- but that, you know, that that he was another big resource, you know, uh, after a while. And, and what was great was that it was like, your money's no good here. You know, he would call me up at four in the morning, come, you want to come by and check out this thing I just subtitled? And then he would send me home with like $8,000 worth of boxes of his stuff. Wow. And I would go home and I would start watching them all. So there was a whole nother area like the european films and things just franco who i am thanks to tim lucas explaining him to me I'm totally addicted to him and i <laughs> luckily I, I actually saw quite a few just franco films either on tv in the 70s 60s 70s uh, and and i'm so happy that i actually saw a few of them in the theater i was like wow. I, I didn't, and i wasn't i didn't even know i remember going to see um we were going to see i think it was busting me and my dad went to go see Busting. And I go into the lobby of the theater, and there are the posters of Coming Soon. Right? You know, it's like the old Bijou Theater. It's a beautiful theater. Yeah. And uh, the, it was Zardoz and Castle of Fu Manchu. I was like, and everything was like, where, and I'm like, 
the thing my dad would always laugh is like he would I, I say he would say I would like stare at him. You know, uh, I was a peewee. I would stare <laughs> and I'd go, "We're going to see these, right?" <laughs> like, and he's like, "Yeah, just give me time to get dinner in my <laughs> milk." My, my my favorite, and this is really a thing about my dad too is, um, you know. It, it, he was such sugar. I love talking about him. He took me, he, he would work like 2000 hours a week. You know, it was impossible to even see my yeah. dad. Sometimes I'd be asleep before he even got home, but this was like 1972, three, something two. And the creeping flesh was playing, was playing. And I, my mom was wonderful. My, my mom used to subscribe me to every horror film magazine on earth, like famous <laughs> monsters, castle nice. Frankenstein was a big one. Cause that was the one that was geared more towards college kids and they had more of the edgy films and reviewed. Joe Dante reviewed for them from the 60s. You know, he was reviewing when he was like 15 uh, from them. So it, was, it had a, a much more scholarly and a, an obscure uh, thing. Like it, uh, the folks, the Red Wolf Inn was reviewed from them. You know, like that's how I found out about those movies, Texas nice. Chainsaw Massacre. But they reviewed <laughs> The Creeping Flesh and Mario Bava, uh, Bay of Blood, but it was called a much better title, Twitch of the Death Nerve. Yep. So great. I had to see that. Of course, I was in second grade. And so my dad came home from work and I had I always did this. I The ritual was I'd cut out the ad from the newspaper and leave it on his dinner plate, real hygienic, and leave it on his And he would come in, I mean, you know, ready to go to bed. And he'd see it, and he, he'd just look up, and he'd go, how long do I have? <laughs> I'd go, it starts at 7.15. This is, okay, it's 6.55. Give me five minutes, and we'll get there. I promise you, if we get there late, we'll sit over. And then the, That's so, so wholesome. We, I love we that. Went, we went to Twitch the Death. My dad slept through the classy one, like Creeping Flesh, right? And he knows. We knew, he knew Cushing and Lee and all these guys. We, yeah. We'd seen them already, you know, since I was born. But I was on his lap, of course, cutting his circulation off in his legs while he's sleep snoring <laughs> and then loudly in this beautiful theater, by the way, it was in a gorgeous theater. I was where they had Star Wars for like a year and a half when it came out. It was a beautiful, immense theater. And uh, the scenes, you, are you familiar with Bay of Blood at all? Oh, yeah. There's a scene where um, the guy's getting... Um, <laughs> getting impaled on the door with yep. a harpoon and he's vomiting up his blood. Like, uh, yeah. my dad, do, wake, yeah. my dad wakes up then <laughs> and I'm on his lap, like kicking my legs. I'm like, I'm you know, so happy because <laughs> I'm tiny. I was tiny in second grade. I'm sorry. I was loved up Pee Wee. I'm still kind of a Pee Wee, but he, uh, his head sort of cranks around to look at me. Because he's probably thinking, how am I, if he says anything about this to mom, or what is that? She wouldn't have cared. Right. She, would, she would get jealous. She wanted to go. You know? but, she, but he goes, turns his head around, and there's the guy, like, you know, ah. And he goes, you having a good time? <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Dad. So it was, so that, that was the thing. I, I was never discouraged. You know, my mom and my grandma, we were up middle of the night, you know, watching Hammer films were on uh, CBS at, like, usually every Friday night wow. at like 1230 at night after the new Avengers was on. I was already, you know, it was like 10 years old by that point, 11 years old. But, you know, that, that was, we were now getting like party time in the family. You know, my, my mom and my grandma, my mom would just cut out, you know, four in the morning, cut out uh, recipes and my grandma would just watch the movies with her, you know? So <laughs> it was really pretty ideal. Uh, but, you know, that's that's how I learned. And then, of course, all the books that I would have got, my mom just bu kept buying me books. You know, uh, there were coffee table books that, you know, if you go on Facebook now, people like fetishize about these things. Oh, yeah. And there's a reason why. It, and I, I get it. Like, it's not like, you know, oh, I love, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is all, gonna, <laughs> this is, this is all, from, all this crap is like from my, um, it, it, it means so much more to me than just, I was entertained by it or, right. uh, you know, entertainment for me is something very different. It's, it's, if you see a, a, a just a, a, a collision of personalities really bringing what they do. Like when I found out what was great was uh, another thing, which uh, now it's sort of like you hear the name and then you have this Medvedian, you know, um, hostility towards these people, but like Larry Buchanan, 
don't know if you know Larry Buchanan, the creatures of destruct. He was basically hired uh, to do. It's just uh, enviable. This rural Texas industrial filmmaker and his crew (laughs) hired to direct remakes of cinema scope or at least crop scope right. AIP Corman films like this wasn't, you know, or, or Arkoff produced films like the, the she creature, or whatever, not Corman, but it was AIP and remake them with his crew on 16 through his process. Yep. So it's like, you know, you, you're putting, you know, good meat in a, in a grinder and someone, <laughs> has a different touch to how yep. they prepare the meat and then the recipe. So I sit there in, in absolute awe and I watch these stuff and it's like, it wasn't just because that was, you know, part of it, it was probably because what it, this is what I was introduced to back then when I was that, that age and it was available to me. But as I got older, I started understanding the, the backstory between who's actually making these things and what yep. they are. Um, I, you know, I just not one of those guys that has to say, Oh, so bad it's good it's really offensive to me you know and i don't i and you know, i take it i don't take it personally but it's like I, my first reaction is you're not impressing me terribly much right. by saying it's so bad it's good there's no i don't care about good and bad i really have no you know i mean i'm not ignoring that there's part of me you know a knee-jerk reaction to something where you know it's not how i would have done it or that doesn't make sense to me but uh at least i'll try and explore through other people what maybe I, how I disconnected from it. And I, I won't, I will, I'll try not to go off and, you know, sometimes now I'll make a joke like on social media, uh, a joke, like someone was, we were joking about the, talking about the new Indiana Jones movie. And I said, uh, and he was like, all oh, looking for, he's oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, you know, I can't wait to, to see this. And I go, you know, and I made some snarky thing about a joke, which I didn't, I didn't mean, I don't, people right. don't know that people don't, I forget people don't realize that everyone <laughs> makes these jokes because they really have no faith in the, the final product, but I couldn't, I really don't care. I, I just, you know, you never know what's going to pop up in, in these films. So I made a joke and he, and he goes, oh, negativity, you know, they, they can't even believe that I'm, I'm like, no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm joking. I'm just an asshole. I'm just kidding. I, I'm not like that's all, for, but I don't feel it. You know, I really don't. I right. don't have that. That's not my first thing. Was it should have been done this way? It should it broke the rules. This is not right. This is terrible. And I'm like, oh wow, I really have no, you know. And sometimes I hear audio commentaries. Um, oh yeah, and I am like, why did you? Why are you doing this? Why did you, you say uh, yes to it to begin with? It, I, some I don't of the, get it. It it, sh- it really is kind of shocking. I mean, and I don't know if. You know, I don't know if people want that, but I don't, you know, I, I, I really don't, uh, I don't care that much to try and fulfill an obligation to what I think people are going to want and not want. I'm hoping that they find whatever, you know, I have to say interesting. And especially people like, you know, the people that I've, I've, I've regularly collaborated with, Nathaniel is a, is a fiend. I mean, like, yeah. I don't even, I, you know, he is, you know, to, you know, a bow down. <laughs> He, you know, <laughs> I, I've done maybe like a hundred and something commentary. He has got, he, I don't know if he meant just Blu-rays. <laughs> I don't know. But he says, <laughs> I just did my 200. When we did Joy House together just recently, the Renee Clement's uh, Joy House. And, uh, and he's like on, on Facebook, like, this is my 200. And I go, 200? Nah, you got, you, this has got to be like your 500. I don't, I don't. Understand. He was saying 200 this year, maybe. <laughs> me <laughs> yeah you know i'm gonna call him out on that one yeah but he's you know he is special he was special. Yeah. he 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 really did get me into this thing and the first thing he said was get to i don't want to uh, i i just want it to be casual i want it to talk like we talk and and that's it i'm not interested in doing you know there's scripted things but that's how he does his section i do my section whatever um, and, uh, and, and occasionally when Steve Mitchell comes in, he introduced me to Steve and that was, you know, uh, that was, that was very fortuitous cause I, I, I wasn't, you know, it's was just, just sort of getting used to doing it with one other person, you know, three people, you know, three people total. Wow. How do you m- negotiate that? Yeah. And we just had th- three different sets of interests that sort of dovetailed. So, uh, that, that worked out nice. Sergio Mims is another person who I really, I don't, you know, you know, 
how I feel about him. Yeah. Uh, it's probably how everybody feels about him. I mean, if you don't know him, there is a real, I'm so happy. There's a really nice Wikipedia page on him now. And you can't cry enough for the, for losing this guy. I got to tell you, there's, there's no, you know, I'm beating you to the punch because I don't want to start crying. If I thought, cause he, I, 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 is one of these people that, you know, um, how did I meet Sergio? Uh, he suddenly sent me a friend request on Facebook and introduced himself and said, uh, I love what you're doing. I, I love this. I just, and yeah. every time uh, a new release that we did, they'd make an announcement like, you know, Kino or someone would make an announcement, it would be on my wall the minute the announcement was made. And he would just go, I can't, I, I've already, I've just ordered this. I have to hear what you have to say. And I'm like, who, what the hell? And I mean, this guy was like, you know, to me, he's like a superstar. And in Chicago, I can imagine, or I can't even right. imagine how he's respected. But meeting him, again, same thing. He may have had um, taste, but I, I, I said to him, same thing, straight off. I, I, I really wanted to do um, a couple of things with him. I really wanted to do Skullduggery with him because I know he he had mentioned um, a couple of Gordon Douglas uh, films and Gordon Douglas is another one where the way I was raised on, on television you they, this was you couldn't escape them I mean this is the stuff that was in rotation you know all these Gordon Douglas right. movies from the sci-fi didn't matter what it was and of course we saw the good ones in the theater like Lady in Cement where there's actually a Lady in Cement <laughs> it's not like some metaphor imagine it's that great <laughs> I was like four or something like i'm like oh tony rome you know uh, you know my sister trying to you know explain why the title song was disgusting tony rome will get you if you don't watch out and he's talking dads lock up your daughters what the so you know gordon douglas was special to me he had this some there was like taboos and his stuff was violent you know i remember going to see barcaro and that was with and the a western with lee van cleef and whatever but and warren oates and it was just i think it was like pg it was you know all you know all ages admitted you know with your of parents course. like okay bring your parents Wow. I mean, people getting the, their skulls blown open. I remember like, wow, these big, like Joel Silver bullet holes in the, in your head, you know? So really cool stuff. But Sergio was really like, you know, game, he, you know? So I don't know. He never inflicted taste on, on some, a judgment. He never put a judgment. Right. He was really cool to sit and work with. And, and for, for that, I actually wanted to talk to my Gordon Douglas buddy, Courtney Joyner, uh, C. Courtney Joyner, yeah. who is a you know great director in his own right and writer. Uh, but he, uh, he also, um, you know, knew all these dudes, you know, and if, and if he didn't yeah. know the films, he certainly, when he came out here, you know, two decades, whatever, decade and a half before I did, two decades, he was talking to these guys that they were still alive, which I envy. But he's, a, to me, so he's, he was like a walking, so, and I did a, I did Breezy, Clint Eastwood's Breezy with him, because he's another, Eastwood was another one, where it's just his wheelhouse, you know, he right. understands, he, under, he, he sees him in a different way than I see him. You know, I see him as a, a guy who basically uh, is just trying to figure out every single imaginable way to validate murder and even million dollar baby it's just like well okay you just can't you just can't get away from this what it is is like <laughs> that that's his key so i never cared if it was like you know if i cared more about a movie than another movie like someone like eastwood or like gordon right. douglas and you know, they all they all it, it's a job i mean the filmmaking is a job unless you're really lucky like norman mailer or someone who just, just said i'm gonna do this on my weekends and alienate my Whatever family want, and, yeah. you know make I, you know, I think i want to be hated this weekend let me make a <laughs> film with everyone i know for now um you know and of course i love norman mailer um in fact i did the, the i don't know if you saw it, but i did the a video essay it's the last thing I watched dance. today. For, uh, there you go. God bless. It's not quite finished. There's there's a couple of revelations in there. I still want to put it, but I can do that because MGM said absolutely no fucking way is this going on the disc. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't understand. We're quote we're quoting we're right. quoting your director. I just think it's. <laughs> They just were ashamed of it in some way, you know, or at least that those people who were dealing with it, they just yeah. didn't understand this monster. And um, 
but I did, and it didn't, it didn't make the di- didn't make the disc, you know. But um, they liked it. Vinegar Syndrome liked, you know, liked it. But I, I would like well, to, you know, do more things with, with for them. But um, this, th- that was that was one thing. Was like, you know, we, me and Kevin Marr, we, we put our our like, heart and soul in this thing. We're both huge Mailer fans. What when I, when I knew Kevin back when I was in New York, not in Los Angeles. Um, he, you know, he would get off from work or something like that, like, you know, for a horrible week of lifting marble, you know, these <laughs> priceless, priceless, priceless statues and stuff like that. Incre- incredible experience. And he'd be exhausted. We both picked up copies of Norman Mailer's Of a Fire on the Moon, which was, he was paid a million dollars uh, by his publisher to uh, write about the uh, 1969, the, moon, the first moon land landing. Yeah. And it was great because we we discovered that you know within a within a certain amount of pages norman Mailer would break out the jewish paranoia it was great <laughs> so so all of a sudden boom like page 15 is like he focuses in it's like okay it's wasps in space and i'm like oh this is just beautiful and we would literally either he'd call me or i'd call him <laughs> i'd pick up the phone and go hello and he'd go and he'd start which would be him nothing no hellos just start reading the chapter to me <laughs> And then I'd like, of course, I'd like, I would take over after he like got hoarse or something. So we we had to do this video essay for about Tough Guys Don't Dance, which I really thought was a really brilliant movie. And I had a cool, I had a cool instance when I was driving home from. Uh, I had I, I was going to SUNY Purchase, and then we I left at a certain point because all all my teachers were taking sabbatical. And if you, if your teacher if, the, if your mentors are leaving, then they're like, oh, I, 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 I don't guess know, I should maybe, go. <laughs> I'm kind of lost now, you know. So I did. But then I ended up at uh, finishing up at um, the, uh, the Bridgeport University Film Department, which was nice too. I mean, that was a little more hands y I think, for, than what I was used to uh, making films. So that was that was kind of interesting. But some really brilliant people, uh, you know, in the department and. Um, I was I was asked to drive uh, the uh, husband of one of my teachers there uh, home, and he unfortunately I think he passed away recently. Too yeah, way too young, of course, but really really great guy, and he had just gotten a gig, and I would have sold my soul writing capsule reviews for Leonard Malton's book, and this was eighty uh, seven, right? Eighty six. When was Tough Guy out? Eighty seven. I think somewhere I think, in there, yeah. Something like that. And I was driving home and he driving he said, Can you can you drive me back to New Haven? And I go, Yeah, of course. I'm right there. Sure. No problem. And we're talking. I was so excited to, you know, first time I actually met him really. And I'm driving him back and he starts saying, Um, so I write for Malton. I'm like, Oh, wow. Maybe <laughs> you're someone I should know. You know, like, hey, they want summer interns for pay. Nice guy. And he goes, Um, oh yeah. No, he actually <clears throat> wait. He put it was yeah I just I just finished a movie I just gave it a bomb rating I go oh what was it he goes tough guys no dance I go get out of my car you know I'm like, I'm right, right I'm like and and he goes really what why 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 what do you what did you, you know, wow you found something interesting I said oh my god are you kidding me there's three sections I said the first section takes place but you know narrated by this absolutely you know. Oh, you know, amateur writer. I mean, he's flor- you know, this, this florid prose that just, you know, pleases no one but himself, you know, yeah. and he's, and he's, you know, totally, you know, a, 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 just a fuck up. And he's got, you know, and it's, and it's mainly during the day, everything shot like mainly during these like gross kind of, you know, you know, New England days where it's moist and gross, muggy. Yeah. muggy yeah. And, and, and overcast and which I like, but you know, and then, uh, and then I said, then there's this this sort of objective middle with Lawrence Tierney and his son. So that's when you're sort of outside both of them. And then it goes into this climax, this whole last third, which is related to you by a cocaine addicted paranoid freak <laughs> who's not in any of the scenes he's he's narrating. Right amazing, right? <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, I said that's fucking amazing right there and it's not even an unreliable narrator he's concocting he's yep. just paranoia he's focusing his paranoia and there you go okay so he was right you know, listened about four months go by five months go by and i see the the new editions out on the shelf right in the bookstore when i went and i'm like ooh, let's look at tough guys don't dance i want to see the bomb <laughs> reading it was now two and a half stars 
And at the end of the review, which was very respectful, it didn't, didn't cast any aspersions, really, just goes, not for all tastes. And I'm like, what a mensch. Look at that. Like, yeah. That, see, and that, was, that was just driving, you know, that was a 10-minute thing. So persuasion is nothing that you, you try and do because you can't, you can't sell yourself to someone who's already the biases are, are right. you know, thick. But you can at least state your case. And if they, you know, humiliate you, then, you know, okay, I scratch them off socially. But if it, at, at any point, and I've, I've had other people come to me, especially people like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which was, you know, that was like my, my you know, ninth birthday gift from my dad <laughs> to be the <laughs> Texas Chainsaw Massacre because I wanted to go see. And then like when it was re-released at, at, at like my last year of high school, I had like a couple of teachers like, t- like cutting out of their class with me to go. And they would get like a, they would call in to, and they would pick me up and we'd go see Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's Just awesome. because I, it was surreal to think <laughs> back and go oh I, my teacher this is insane so um so that was pretty that was that was pretty cool like that you know those kind of it's like, it's like you, you and this this one guy really great really cool guy from from college uh purchase and he he was like an assistant director to like very you know went on to like really great stuff and and i always knew he was a really smart guy but he he comes up to me he he knew he goes. I found out that you like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This is like freshman year. So what did we anyway? <laughs> no. And I go, yeah. He goes, I'm really disappointed in you. And that was it. Like I'm like, what? But but I didn't. You know, I, I'm still thinking. You know, he has his reasons why that didn't agree with him or whatever. I don't. You know, I don't know his personal history with it. I don't know. Right. I don't know where he's coming from. So I didn't hold it against him because that's what ha- that's anybody, even me. You know, I'm, I, I you know everybody falls into that. But he. Uh, at a certain, I think it was at graduation or something around the time of graduation. He he came to me and goes, "I really want to apo- no." I know it was it was a, a, a really great professor of ours uh, did it, showed it as the, the one of the last movie of a certain of a really amazing uh, class that he had where he was showing like you know, like eighty films during this one semester, Jeez. and uh, and I actually got I got it for him. I I was like the only person who had to get a print back then. You know, like it must have like eighty five <laughs> right. or something. Like that. It wasn't it wasn't so it wasn't so hard to fit, but it was people had to, you had to poke around and, and know where to get it. And he scheduled it. It was on. It, was, it happened to be scheduled it on my birthday. So, oh. and I wasn't even in the class. I, I was at I was at Bridgeport at this point. I wasn't even at the school, but I was sitting in on his class because I had to. You know, of I wanted course, to hear. Yeah. I wanted to hear him talk. And uh, and he just goes, oh, oh, I, before he showed the movie, he goes, oh, I was thinking, you know, thank you, Howard. You know, Howard. Happy birthday. <laughs> like, oh, that was so forever. <laughs> that movie is now sewn emotionally into my body because the one, you know, one of the people, one of the teachers that I just thought That's was like amazing. G- genius level guy. Yeah. Uh, this guy, he, he's uh, Tom Gunning. Tom's Gunning. He's a, uh, uh, I think, I tenured now. I don't even know. He might, might be retired from a university. He was the head of University of Chicago's film department, which wow. was like, yeah, that's like uh, Matterhorn. Um, but he was, he's just a, a brilliant guy. I could just listen to him, you know, cuss, you know, at, you, you know some, you'll get something great out of that, you know. Um, but, uh, but, but that, but that movie, and he, uh, he came to me afterwards, the, the, the kid came to me and said, I, I t- you know, I apologize. It was, it's embarrassing. I, pro- I apologize. You know, but I said, well, you don't have to apologize for not liking that, James. That same human context that made them be so negative towards you. That's what makes your stuff, in my opinion, so freaking relatable because it'll be, it's it'll good. be tough guys don't dance. And you'll hear 60% of the world's population go, this is tripe. This is God awful. But somebody like Howard will go, no, pay attention. This yeah. can actually be amazing. And one of the things, I, I spout it so many times on this channel is that every single movie has been somebody's favorite movie at some point. And if you right? give it the respect, you will yeah. get something out of every single film. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, and I'm not even, I'm not even asking people to do that, but they'll, they'll think that I, you know, they'll just, you know what I get is I get like, Oh, you love everything. I said, I have not, it's not, that's not the point. I don't care. I don't, I don't care if I it's, like it's it so or not. It's more I, fun to talk about things that you enjoy rather than just shit on things that you don't. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's 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 layers and layers and layers to stuff. You know, I mean, I read this great book, and I've been I've been talking about it lately, you know, a lot because I uh, one of my uh, I, ne- uh, I don't know, I never met him, uh, Ken Russell. Um, I grew up watching his movies, of course. 
the depth, you know, I'm that one of the, my mom with her, you know, if he's old enough to ask things, that was one of them. The devils was one of them that we, we had driven like wow. 45 minutes. That's a family to go see the devils. It was, we didn't know X rated. We didn't know. We don't know what that meant. So they, they turned us away and we went, uh, across the street and saw something else i don't i forgot what it was <laughs> straw dogs actually i think it was <laughs> that was rated r um we went to see that but peckham was another one in my heart you know um but ken russell I, we went to go see women we saw women in love in the theater i saw i think we saw billion dollar brain but i don't you know i was like the size of a raisin at that point i was tiny and uh and then we and i remember the boyfriend was the one that really made an impact on me when i saw it as a kid because it was it was cut, still cut by like a half an hour but wow. it was just to me the most brilliant thing i've ever seen in my life and i was a little little kid i was probably like not even maybe five or six just about to turn six and me and my sister we were just laughing our heads off we probably didn't even know why it was just so choreographed in such a way where it just telegraphed these these great moments to me uh, and it certainly wasn't a typical film like a comedy that you know i would have i could i can't point another i can't compare it to another movie especially right. visually um so it, it you know but something about the way he had his actors uh, you know move and and act and and the beats and, and the cuts and the fantasy of it was just something that I, I don't know. I never experienced it before. So it was really profound. And then it would be on TV cut to 74 minutes to fit into a 90 minute time slot. I remember that. <laughs> and, uh, it made, it, it didn't matter. It just didn't matter to me. So I, I so yeah. this one guy, and again, sad to say he, he passed away the past couple of years ago. Uh, this guy, Ken Hank, Hanky. He's called Cranky Hanky because he was always very irascible when I, even when you com complimented him, he's like, ah, and I was like, oh, okay. But he wrote the last word on Ken Russell. And I'm saying, like, you read one page and you put the book down. It's a process, you know? He nailed this, the, like, not just nothing about superficial anything. It was all text and subtext and what what a music cue, the reference of the music cue, not only pertained to the movie itself, but to the movies that came prior and past and how all these things are interconnected by gestures or by... And that suddenly... I mean, it's nothing I looked for or sought out. It was This is the thing that I love is language. Right. And I, I think... And that's what Kevin and I, when we did destructible man we he would come out for a good long time i told you and we'd watch movies and every once in a while we'd see something with what we i mean i guess it's called we, we call it the dummy death where a, an actor playing a character is substituted for uh by, by a, a a dummy for um a, a death scene or a near death scene sometimes uh if it's a comedy sometimes they don't die like getting a mad 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 world where everyone's yeah. chucked off a fire in <laughs> and, and then uh, but we we sort of like by watching thousands of these we started like a registry of these movies so it wasn't like it's not like when like uh, you know like the Alamo Draft House or something would have these hilarious compilations where like the greatest death scenes ever we weren't even looking at it in any kind of mocking or you know tr triggered way. I wouldn't even right. say ma mocking because it's there's a lot of affection in, in seeing these things. So I don't think they're really you know entirely mocking it. Although sometimes you know you go oh look how bad that was, that effect was. Right. <laughs> we don't see we don't see it as an as a bad effect. We see it as something that unlocks because of its existence in the film. It unlocks levels of reading that is the same in every movie one appears yep. in, whether intentional or not, most probably unintentional, which means it has something to do with the language itself. And after a while, you know, you can argue, but you know, this movie has a dummy death and it doesn't have, you know, uh, you know, these abstracted, you know, images like of, you know, we noticed immediately you'd see a dummy death and you'd start seeing uh, photographs, 
drawings, maybe montages of drawings where characters are abstracted immediately into, you know, uh, draw art and draw uh, sculptures. And a lot of times sculptures where you think a shadow of a sculpture is a real person. And then, ah, it's a statue. And then <laughs> every time. So after a while, we'd start seeing this shit and we'd go, I bet you dummy death's coming. And, and yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Dummy death coming up. But that's not intentional. No one's, you know, we hadn't, we not, we didn't write the book yet. You know, I mean, this is, so uh, this is something that, that fascinates me is that, uh, and of course, then I find out, you know, doing research and trying to defend my, because you know, I, uh, Kirla Janice, another, God bless you, <laughs> brilliant person, far more brilliant than she even knows, that's for sure. Um, but she's, I think I have her masterpiece somewhere here. Yeah. The, the her her folk horror documentary yeah. three hour folk documentary god bless it god just yeah makes me makes me weak in the knee you know, seriously like weak in the knees because it was done the right way it was done from oh, her yeah. heart from her heart and from a lot of other people's hearts she found the right people but with with this sort of thing, she she asked me if i would do uh for she used to have the um i think it just ended she just handed the reins over yeah. uh and and it started in canada and went there's in, in London and then New York and and then here also was her uh, the Miskatonic uh, University the yeah. horror, horror studies and twice she let me do this class once in New York and once here on destructible man on, on the dummy deaths and uh, the, the the whole the whole thing is it's it, it's it's language I I discovered because I was trying to find there has to be some root in the history of story to a visual storytelling that this would make some kind of an impact if there's yeah. a reason it has to happen and um yeah it was pretty easy i found it pretty quickly it was the uh, supposedly the first edit in a film was in fact a guillotining of an actor an actress and she loses her head in one one shot but it's not it was the first cut to sh to replace the actress with, with the dummy yeah. the dummy and what that's why i say well you know if you're watching a movie and and you don't you know it doesn't even has all these themes but it doesn't have a dummy death in it this is what happens when you make film it's language so yeah. the storytelling starts to seep into you know the scripts uh great movie great movie P peter bogdanovich's and of course it was treated like crap when it came out but um his, I'll even say more, watch his director's cut, the black and white. It was shot in color, but Laszlo Kovac shot it for him, and they planned for it to look like black and white. So he lit color for black and white. It really is just beautiful. Uh, it's called Nickelodeon. And it is the my my favorite film about the history of films. I, wow. I, I've, I've, ne I've never seen anything. W.D. Richter, who wrote the script for... Uh, he, well, he directed the Buckaroo Banzai, but he wrote the script for... Uh, Philip Kaufman's genius re remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. He's just the, one of the wittiest, smartest screenwriters um, of, of his era. He wrote Slither, Howard Zeiff's Slither is another crew, James Kahn, hilarious, but really smart film. Yeah. And uh, so he, he, he did this thing, which just explains that you, back in the day, you grabbed people you thought were intelligent off the street and you threw them behind the camera and you said, I'll pay you this much if you can make five films in this week. <laughs> you know? And we're, 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 we're battling the Griffith studio. So we have to yeah. really get in there and do, and like, well, what do I do? I've never, I've never, well, here, watch these. And you watch 10 films you're given the camera and the crew and the actors and you go and you make the film. That's the history of films. So that's like, you know, people dissing on Quentin Tarantino, which I always thought was like, you know, that's like showing your ass really like, you know what? He's just an enthusiastic dude and he's, right. he's got an incredible, you know, you know, he might have opinions, you know, and, and I, I never got into, you know, talking about opinion with him because it's for me it's valueless except if he's excited about something that's a that's a gateway for me you know i, I don't really care why someone doesn't like something i always care more if they just start talking about films and i can listen to them and hear exactly. their, their periphery but 
you know, you, people get on him. He's a thief. He's a thief. Well, you know, did you ever listen to the Criterion uh, laser disc for Raging Bull, where in the first 10 minutes, Scorsese rattles off, I took this shot from that movie because this context <laughs> that pre- does this to me. And then, and then I have that. And this comes in, uh, you know, uh, this is a, a direct lift from the, the opening of the Crimson, Crimson Kimono because, you know, uh, Fuller really, you know, it expresses this and this and this harmonically. I mean, yeah, they, I mean, thief. That's the whole. That is language. Language well, is the one we just talked about was yeah. Bay of Blood. Everything from Bay of Blood was lifted. All, it's all augmentation for me because yeah. the director is going to pro- Larry Buchanan. He's just processing what what came before. The only way, technically, you know, budgetarily, and the way he knows how in this situation. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes it'll get better. Do you ever see, you know, the uh, the strawberries need rain. The Buchanan Bergman film. I've not seen did. that one. No, it's a Ingmar. Ber- it's just like an Ingmar Bergman film. He was influ- and and it's markedly different in style wow. than the other one. It's not like he. These are terrible filmmakers. I don't see it. I don't care. What right. I care is that you, you're 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 privileged. You're you're in a privileged place where you know you you can watch. Um, you can realize things beyond the superficial and and that's to me that's a that's a gift i mean i i feel so privileged my whole life was basically un unrestricted you know and i tried you know well my i have a i have a niece who you know i, I love i have two nieces i love my nieces but this one um she she grew up um sort of handicapped in a way she she had um noonan syndrome so um but she's you know sharp as tack but there's there's trickle down effects that affect yeah. uh, affect her but um while my sister and my brother-in-law he's also passed away <laughs> everyone's gone <laughs> ghosts that i love um they uh they they were they it's just a, they were just wonderful with her and they would trust me to show her movies wow. so she's four years old and She's going around my room, which this is nothing. I mean, this is Los Angeles. This is this is like well, one one hundredth. I mean, I have like I don't know, like sixty thousand films, but in something in different media's, you know, like wow. MP4s from like a decade ago. Yeah. I mean, oh, thousands and thousands of them, and then there's DVDs, and then the, and my my poor friend, God, if he knew how much I love him, he had he took on my collection in his living room as a friend when my my parents both passed away and we sold the house and i i <laughs> his his living room has looked like the last scene from raiders of the lost ark for <laughs> uh, too long um you know so one day i'll 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 i'll, I'll treat you right Dave. um but but this is you know um this is just stuff that I, you know, I, 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 you, I need, I need to consume this stuff, right. you know, and, and I, and the last thing I need is for some sort of discouragement, you know, and I don't, I don't endorse it. I don't, I don't, there's just no way you're missing. You're going to miss too much. You're just short cheating your own bed, you know? Yeah. And I, but that's not for me to, to care about or judge. So, you know, I, I just so appreciate people like you who, who that's what, that's what kind of turns you on, you know? And I'm like, wow, I really didn't even know. I, I didn't know. And still, I, I, until I started looking at like these boutique labels and their, you know, the, you know, the podcasts that people, you know, are now obsessing on or yeah. you know, they, they're appreciating people like, you know, Tarantino in the right way. Not that he's some demigod, but that his movies, you know, he made that once upon a time in Hollywood. And to me, that was just this, that, that was everything I I had hoped he would do without realizing it. There's, yeah. there's these levels and levels and levels and a thoroughly unreliable narrator where you just, it's, it's impossible to judge what's real, what's not real. Of course, none of it's real because it's a film. So that's a, but if you watch certain scenes, there's going to be scenes where it's told by a narrator right. who's never seen. And then you see characters behaving certain ways, which tell you right off the bat that they don't like the scenes with the uh, Brad Pitt 
of waiting to find out what uh, the, 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 either the, the producer or the director, Kurt Russell, arguing it out, whether I should fire him or not from the production with uh, the actor, you know, with the Leonardo DiCaprio in his trailer. Yep. And, and there's response reaction where that character can't, can't hear what's going on. He doesn't know what's going on. And, and there's things that just sort of affect, I don't want to ruin it for people who haven't seen it, but t- to me, there's like these wonderful little um, thoroughly cinematic moments and yep. and it's and it's and Fred Raskin is this type of editor who just latches in so easily and understands the reality of what you need to consume, not the reality if this was real because it ain't never going to be real. Right. So there's this sort of other understanding of what this movie is, the world, and and that's why you know talking about like Stanley Kramer or Dick Richards, there's certain there's and there's other directors who blow my mind now, which again are very divisive. Um, and I won't ruin it because I'm probably, I, I'm definitely going to try and do something <laughs> on these people for just on my own. But there are some people out there, directors out there who their movies ultimately come to a realization that their characters can't move forward in the script that of the story that they're involved in for a reason that is that they actually don't get that they are characters portrayed by actors in somebody's movie and it's in there and you go yeah. holy crap why there's levels yeah why and, and, and there doesn't have to be any reason for it for me it's just the fact that that exists because the language is that you know it's that versatile it's that elastic is that right. you can you can just really have a great time uh in, with any mood if you don't really if you just want to try and be entertain yourself and have a judgment for it eh, okay. exactly. That's, that, there's the game you, you got the first level but then there's others and but there's a lot of people who like really, you know, I, it's it's just bizarre. They will hold it against me <laughs> for, for, <laughs> for not communicating on some kind of like, you know, gut level. I'm not a human, you know, I'm not with emotion. Well, no, it has nothing to do with it. I, you know, but I, I just am not interested in myself all that much. I really, or you, <laughs> no, no offense. <laughs> I just, I really care more about your perceptions so that I can, walk away my brain can you know more grooves can be you know forged in my brain that's that's the that's you know you hear you're addicted to movies i think that's when you're really addicted i'm addicted i will live homeless but i will never give up my collections of of my books or my my film you know i I will i'll make a a you know i'll make an apartment out of that in someone's backyard if they let me (laughs) before i go homeless but and that's where you can sense, uh, you know, like I said, the 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 context that you bring to these that are personal, because there are certain things that are baked into these that are moments, obviously, in this grander narrative. But the way that we grab onto certain things can change the meaning of an entire film. Can obviously, by the way you're speaking on it, can latch on to a memory for you. You can oh, never forget yeah. a moment of sitting on your dad's lap because of a scene in a film, and it will live with you till the moment that you die. And that's. To me, that's the magic of some of these. It's Proustian, right? That's like this. It is this thoroughly emotional, yeah, trigger factory. It never goes away. Now, I was fortunate. I know a lot of people aren't as fortunate, like with the up- upbringing is that I was. You know, I mean, whether it's whatever, you know, parents weren't ready to be parents or whatever. So, I, I, I know I'm. I'm again. I, I know it's not. I'm not, I'm not everybody. It's not an every man situation, but, but I, I think what you're saying is definitely relatable to everybody. It, you can, whether, whether you, whether it's a sparkling moment or not, uh, an, an emotional trigger, um, to art, whether it's a book or whether it's music or, or a movie, I agree. And I, I just, it, it will, it does happen. You know, like I can't listen to, uh, Ed Ames or the Ames brothers, Ed Ames singing a time to a oh, time to remember. Is that what it's called? I think um, it, it was just one of these songs from like the sixties that I will bur- burst out crying. If I have to hear that, all it reminds <laughs> me of is that the people I love are all gone. I can't, can't handle it, you know? So it's not a terribly great thing to have to go through, you know, right. frisbeeing an album out of your house because you, you want to get the you know, exercise, the demon of that pain, horrible right. pain. But you know, is it so bad or is it, is it, I mean, I'll still never be able to listen to the song, but 
is it a bad thing to have to have had to go through that? Because it focuses so many emotions um, on whatever level that was. I mean, the song is, is, you know, reflective, but to me, it's hardcore pain, you know, right. real unshakable lifelong pain. But am I grateful for that? Maybe, maybe you know, and, but, you know, uh, and I think, Maybe because there's so many people who are who are listening, you know, not just to us, but I'm talking about just when they're buying Blu-rays and things like that. That that levels it when they do hear us talking, um, even in a lighthearted way or something. I, I'm always hoping that that you know they're they're going to be willing to share their their own thing. Because again, I don't care if they liked it or you know like a movie or don't like a movie. No interest. What I want to know is what what they thought. What they what they gleaned from it, what they pull out, because it's certainly not going to be everything I picked out. So I just want to learn, right? I mean, that's the I'm I'm alive, and well, before before you know whatever hits me, uh, Alzheimer's or cancer or whatever, I really would like to pull this stuff. I would like to you know. So I enjoy a, a lot of these people, you know. Like I said, the, the Ken Hankey, same thing. It's like as a, as a person, I could never sit in the room with him because he was always some you know cranky about everything but he knew that i loved that book more than anything and then I, I was just so sorry that it stopped at like crimes of passion that it didn't go farther and i kept trying to say to him and we're like all right will you kind of finish this now no more <laughs> and uh, i was like yeah i'll get to it i don't know i don't know, I don't know. I want to get back but it's that kind of thing where you know I, there's just when there's certain things there's just no way that my you know i'm not an academic i'm there's no there's no, you know, I, I shy away from it. You know, I'm not, right. I don't think I'm smart, so smart enough in that, in that way to, to understand something on a purely academic, I'm not going to go, you know, watch a movie and then pull out, you know, my Rousseau or, or my, you know, uh, my, my Swedish philosophers. Yeah. I, Start I, checking not, footnotes. I, yeah. yeah <laughs> I, 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 not, not, I'm, I'll listen, you know, throw it at me. I'm, I'm, I'll learn, you know. But I can't, I'm not going to be the one responsible for that. That's for sure. And definitely like, you know, it's weird when you hear, you see the label, they, they try and figure out the people making the packaging on some of these sets. And they go, like, film historian. Go, <laughs> Do I know the history? of, of Maybe. I, I guess that's a story. I'm, I'm not, certainly not an academic, but I, 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 I lived, I lived these. The, the greatest thing was this guy, Joe Venegas, was a great guy. Um, he was doing a lot of stuff with Arrow, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, uh, really just a cool guy. Um, I love the way he loved movies. You know, it's just one of these things where I just, I, I didn't even have to talk. I just wanted to hear what he had to say about stuff. He's just a great guy. And he pulled me into this arrow stuff too. And, uh, as a talking head mainly, and then ultimately as an interviewer. So I would do, you know, I would, I would interview people for, for arrow. Um, and he, yeah, it, it was really cool. He called me up one day and said, I, I, I do volunteer work at the ASC. Would you like to interview, we're doing a career interview on uh, cinematographer Richard Klein, who happened to have shot Gellerman's King Kong. Um, and I'm like, what? Because I mean, he was one of the first, <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah, yeah. So he got the clearance and they're very strict at the AFI. They're like, yeah, it's like, it's like, and you have to go through like, you know, the, the trials of fire before they allow you in the room with right. one of their, you know, their society. Members. They're beloved. Yeah. Right. They're, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I, and I, I respect them for that. That was great. You know, they're very protective. Um, but he introduced me to Richard Klein, who I grew up with, like the name. And back then the names cinematographer, the, the editors, the cinematographers, the screenwriters, they got equal, you know, titles to the actors or, you know, it wasn't all oh, yeah. actor oriented. This was like 1972. I remember I told him I saw Soylent Green and, you know, you know, director of photography, Richard H. Klein. <laughs> it's like the scope frame and the nor or Panavision got huge credit and he was laughing he's like oh my god how old were you i go i don't even think i was seven maybe eight <laughs> going to eight you know and he was just he just thought that was just wonderful and so he kept stopping the interview to say how do you how do you know how do you know that like, well I, I i just i grew up like that i tell him the whole story like you know 
I'm like, well, this is, you know, I grew up with you, you know, I don't want to say, you know, I'm, I was a kid, I was a little kid and you were a formative influence right. by association. I had to figure out what your contribution was and how everything. So then I would, you know, that's another thing is watching film to film to film with other people other than the director or the writer, you start to, you know, realize that there's a lot of valuable people, you know, interlocking on these things. So he, he became, my dream came true very quickly. He, I got a call after, you know, two days, three days after we finished the interview, he hadn't had enough. He wanted to come by and I said, Oh, you know, I have all your films. I, I don't know if you want to take a look at this because he doesn't, he didn't care about other, other things. He just right. was work, worked. He was, I think he was like 91 or 92 when he passed away. Wow. He was a surfer um, until he was like 60. And he, uh, his dad was, um, uh, uh, shot some stuff for, um, John Ford silence for John Ford. And, uh, he was a, a Columbia pictures cinematographer. He was one of the rotating photog- uh, cinematographers on the monsters, which is one of the most beautifully photographed. It was oh, done yeah. like, a, they were done like movies. They weren't done like, you know, three camera setup sitcoms. Like I love yeah. Lucy in front of a live audience. These were shot like films. And uh, so his so his dad got him into uh, you know working on uh, you know as a cameraman or even even lower and then worked his way up to assistant camera and camera and uh, then he was given a chance to do a, a really great film of course that I one of my late night extravaganzas when I was a kid called Chamber of Horrors a high Averback film uh, that was done with Patrick O'Neill uh, the, the the fear with the, the horror horn would go off yeah. before a, and they would you know graphic violence you know they would chop you chop a <laughs> hand off and you know woo, and the flat fear flasher you know these things would go off and um and he shot that and, and what happened was uh, mm-hmm. he told me joshua logan who you know did uh you know t- t- picnic with william holden um he was sitting in on the dailies at warner brothers and um Towards the end of the the shoot, he asked Rich, "Says, well, what's your schedule after this film?" And he goes, "Oh, I'm, I'm just finishing this up, and I'm, I'm I'm trying to figure out what the next thing is." He goes, "Well, I'm doing Camelot. Would you be interested in doing that?" I'm sitting down, to, so he went and discussed it with him, and he took the job, and was nominated on his second film for his first Academy Award as cinematographer. So, of course. you know. Um, he was just an amazing so he became like a really close friend and every tuesday and thursday he would come over and we'd watch something we watched the mechanic together wow. and he would tell me all about michael winner who i'm obsessed with uh another guy who i think you know deliberately tried to uh steer people the wrong way confuse people disorient people towards who he was and what he was talking about so you'll watch a michael winner movie and you go it's so bad it's good it's really he, most probably fueled with contempt for audiences like you <laughs> who hoped it would be a better movie. You know, like right. he would, you know, it's like the kind of, you know, a real scumbag, you know, sarcastic, facetious creep. And the contempt just became more and more spring loaded. He was making some very clever satires in the, in the, in, in England in the sixties. And then he would go in and start working in America for a studio system for American, you know, American productions and that ultimately were hits internationally. And he, um, he slowly started to revert to not what he was doing, where he made like overt comedies, satire, satiric comedies, like he did in England in the sixties, but he started to take, popular genres that were I, I i wouldn't say he thought they were beneath him i think he thought the audiences were <laughs> beneath <laughs> him and like the death wish people like he was just like you know oh uh, you know then i'm gonna i'm gonna give you this <laughs> you're gonna have to deal with it you know uh, and it was and it was something so contemptuous satire and he sort of falls in line with a totally different a guy who uses language in a totally different way, but is my Lord and master is Brian De Palma. Um, and people go, what's your favorite De Palma? I go, uh, his movies. So yeah. I was like, what do I, I'm not is it one over another. I got you out of your mind. Please. <laughs> you, 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 you're going to miss something if you don't, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, and I, you know, so winner and him are the most, I think trigger happy. Like 
there, you know, and it's no joke that, you know, De Palma has confessed many times that Godard is like really his favorite, you know, favorite director yeah. or, you know, in his mind, when you're talking in an interview, you say, oh, Godard's an influence. Oh, yeah, of course it is, you know, you know, contempt. I mean, you couldn't even have a more beautiful, you know, na- you know, name of a, of a masterpiece by a, yeah. a director that you're in love with. But that, so again, that's, those are the kind of people that, that, that I, I don't defend them because it's not, I don't, you know, I don't think they need defense. I think it's interesting to hear, you know, a sidebar on them perception because it put you know it kind of puts them in focus a little bit what they're what i see they're trying to do aside from what you've assumed they're doing a lot of people like to watch movies and assume that if they the shoot if it's like you know a square peg in a round hole it's failure you know even another man who i love beyond words is robert aldrich even he because he was a studio guy he he liked making the studio a better place for employees he was a huge union guy um you know and and he was a, a, a really tried to make a difference his his personal taste was difficult to commercially uh sort of when he was made his own studio after the dirty dozen the success of the dirty dozen he did about five years of this of these amazing films like the grissom gang or killing of sister george uh i mean you know uh, he i mean he ended up going going back and to Universal and doing Ozana's Raid, which, you know, is just getting sort of um, its accolades now. It was yeah. kind of like, again, dismissed for a while. Not, I don't think it was ever really banned, but it was just sort of like, eh, you know. But here you have a movie, and this is another one that, that I, it, it sits in my, a corner of my chest near my heart, where the, the heart beats the, the most, is that I watch a guy who's doing a movie, and he's in thorough competition now with about 10 Western series that have been on the air for 12 years, still popular, Gunsmoke, still popular, and in the early 70s, things like that. And he has to prove himself now back to doing studio films. He's his own collapse now. And there you have a movie about this guy, Ulzana, who is an old Indian chief. We actually do the, we do a deconstruction of uh, Emperor of the North, the Dummy Deaths and Emperor of the North on Destructible Man on the, a long time ago on the website. Nice. Still blog. And part of this was my realization of this, of what he was doing, is that Ulzana, this old chief, cruel, they define him as sort of have a, a very cruel sense of humor, meaning torture. He likes to torture people. And he finds that amusing because he's taking their power, their, their flaunting power. And he can take the power because he's still, even though he's old and he's should be put out to pasture, they think, and put in a reservation or killed, he thinks differently. And he goes on this rampage, this, you know, sort of like a Alan Pakula film called a, a Robert Mulligan, but Pakula, I think, produced a, the um, Stalking Moon, kind of a similar storyline. Or this Indian goes on a rampage, and it's almost like a horror movie. I mean, you know, Pauline Kael used to refer to the Stalking Moon as a horror, a gothic horror western, and that nice. was immediately I was like, I have to, I have to see this. Have to. But Aldrich, when he made Ulzana's Raid, I think the western was simply a showcase for him and his turning fifty-five or fifty-six. Audiences aren't; they're not lining up. For the, like the dirty dozen like they did you know six years earlier or whatever yeah. who am i who am i i deserve my power i earned it i created a language this is my own language that i use his editing with michael luciano for the majority of his movies and uh joe byrock for his shooting his later more of his later stuff after ernst laszlo uh, went on to stanley kramer it, you want respect in a certain way, and he wasn't getting any of it. So this is how he sort of indicated that I'm Ulzana, and I'm not really, I don't think I'm going to go anywhere. You just better, you know, look out before I tie your dad up and burn his feet and face off. And you know, like, this is like, you know, this is, but that's heartbreaking to me. And then yeah. what was so gratifying, you know, I mean, now it's gratified. Back then it was a disaster. It was Emperor of the North, which is a ma- to me a masterpiece, you know, which just confirms that. And then, of course, 
Faith was there. Longest Yard came, you know, the next film. So, so two, fil- you know, one film leapfrogging after uh, Olzana, you have the respect he wanted back again from Dirty Dozen. And what's great is that no one really even noticed that Dirty Dozen and Longest Yard are almost pornographic in their uh, mor- in their moral stance. It is, it is, you know, I mean. And, and this is what he enjoyed, and going all the way back to like autumn leaves, you know. So you, right. you have a guy who is just, he's maturing along with other people who are creating with him the same projects, but that's the language. So, my God, you know, how can you, how can you look at the choir boys, which was, boy, was that a divisive commentary? I mean, the film itself was just really, when it came out, it was, I mean, it was based on a novel that was popular and, you know, you have Robert Aldrich, you have a, 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 a book which borderlines on almost supporting fascism. And then you have <laughs> a director who is as left wing as you could possibly, you know, get, you know, uh, at that in, in the studio system at that time, making making films that weren't supposed, you know, weren't supposed to be lefty films. But he was, and and the Choir Boys is really quite critical of, of a lot of these things that people took sacred. It was very right. sacrosanct. Um, and Wamba's a, a brilliant writer and very, you know, also kind of non, superficially non-political. And that's, again, what was so appealing to him that everybody could attach. But if you adapt a movie from a source novel or source material, damn, you're you're screwed. If, you know, if someone says, it's not like the book in the book, I mean, the way you go, he didn't take the book away and the book's there. I mean, what is, yeah. are you, but you know, it's not an auteurist world. You're not supposed to go in really and go, oh, it's an Aldrich film. And that, that came about, you know, that, that was people, you know, critics and, and academics sort of forging. I mean, don't forget the searchers was just like a shitted on movie. Yeah, until like 1982 or 83, when suddenly people started saying, "Oh, it's a, you know, this is a classic." For right. it's only people like you know the film brats, like you know Shrip, Paul Schrader, and, and uh, Scorsese and De Palma, who really went, you know, went the the, the distance for it. Uh, so it's not you're not supposed to go in. The movies aren't really made that way. You are supposed to just go in, just experience it, and walk out. It just sort of it's just a phenomenon to me that. The language is so flexible, so elastic. You get these brains that go in there, and you're getting like 30 films for the price of one. I don't know if you ever saw De Palma's <laughs> Redacted. Whoa, did I almost lose friends over Redacted? This is just inept, and there's a piece of shit, and it's just that's so <laughs> far beneath him. And I'm like, well, I, you know, I get it. It's, it's found footage, but did you look at what kind of found footage? There's like eight different types. You have like, you know, your, your insurrectionists having their own you know, YouTube channel, their <laughs> political, where they're cutting people's heads off. And, and then you have like the army who is, they're doing their own thing, you know, on, on, on social media. And you're seeing that. And then you have like these, these two, one of the funniest was that the French, the two French filmmakers with Paco Bell playing on the soundtrack while they're doing, you know, these beautiful, you know, long shots from, you know, telescope shots of, of the, the, the troops like standing around, you know, waiting for a right. bomb to go off. And of course there's dummy deaths in that too, but that's a different story. Um, but I, I went and I was showing, uh, a work in progress. I was in Sheffield, England. I was showing a work in progress of a documentary that I'm st- still trying to f- get through the copyright horrors with this uh, Life and the Death of Joe Meek. Um, and we were showing, we, had a, we were in the festival in Sheffield, wonderful venue, beautiful theater, a beautiful community theater. It was, it was just incredible, gorgeous place. And they had, you know, a bol- bunch of theaters and they were showing the opening weekend of Redacted. So my, I was like, yeah, I get to see Redacted every fucking afternoon if I want to. And they had like these big bad, like you really went to town in the lobby to, because it was very, they, they really wanted to educate their, their right. community. It was great. I love the attitude. And, and they were showing it and they had the big, like, you know, wall size, you know, New York times review or something like that. Right. You know, it was beautiful work they had. But it's all about like, what a great war film it was, or a liberal war film. And I'm like, and I'm like uh, <laughs> yeah, but you're not 
seeing the same thing. I mean, Brian De Palma is Brian right. De Palma. So he talks about voyeurism a lot, right? Yeah, he talks about all the, you know, yeah, exactly. the language yeah. of film, right? So here you have a guy who's mocking eight different types. Like, he's sitting here going like, okay, when I was in film school, I fucking had to kill my ass and everybody else's to get... I had a sh- I had a I had a change the changing bag and get the film yeah. and then if I didn't know whether it was going to be a good take or a bad take I was in the trenches with this thing and here you are with your laptops and your iPhones and your you know whatever <laughs> and so it, it's part of like this trilogy with that and um, uh, the, the passion that he did afterwards and then ultimately a hilarious film the. Uh, the last one he did, um, God help me if I remember this one. Um, Isn't it Domino? Domino, which I loved, but of course, you know, eye in the face for that uh, publicly. <laughs> it's a great movie, but he's commenting on the fact that we have technology that he would have killed for back then. Right. But look how misused it is. Look how absolutely, I mean, passion begins with the back of a, Apple laptop and it ends with the back of an Apple laptop. I mean, like, yeah. it's really funny. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, but people expect the superficial. They expect him to make a movie about war. So here he's doing a film about war. Well, he does, but you're not going to like what he has to say is that ultimately, you know, look, look what being on camera does to you. I mean, one of the main right. characters in that movie, it's just genius, is, is a, um, I think a Hispanic uh, kid who, joined up for this suicidal war non-war war to be a marine but only because he's going to document that on his video while he's at while he's doing his tour of duty so that when he gets back he'll get into nyu film school just by shooting a, you know, not because of any kind of technical, you know, or, or structural epiphany he had as a filmmaker. He wants to get, he's going through this so he can just get the footage and go back and it's a, it's a you know, free pass into NYU film school. So, of course, right. he's blown to pieces on then put on <laughs> the Insurgency's uh, website. I mean, that to him, I can only see is he thinks that's fucking hilarious. And if he doesn't, I certainly do. So, Again, it's like he's, you know, you have f- filmmakers who are making movies satisfying the commercial expectation and at the same time way beyond the call of duty and I think almost self sacrificial. <laughs> they're, they're triggering people, you know, yeah. with, with, their, with their contempt. But that's what you can do with movies, with commercial films. But again, there, there may be a certain self sacrifice to that if you're, you know, like Robert Aldrich or something where you are. Again, I, I just, I, I, you know, he, he must just have this um, sense of security of, of like, I've accomplished what I needed to accomplish. And that he's not one of these guys that just gropes for, for, right. for you know, I mean, even Mission Impossible is uh, about as subversive as you can get. I mean, with him with handing over a commercially established franchise, uh, you know, as a TV series. And then, oh, my God, he's the guy who's doing the, the yeoman <laughs> Venture. I was great. I was like, I pantless, you know, pants off. <laughs> Happy time. But that, you it's know, perfect. But, but if, but if no one's willing to discuss the, the point is when I saw it at Sheffield, I had to, I saw it and I had to explain it to that. They were like, nobody's coming. Nobody's coming. Right. I said, well, I think it's because you're, maybe you're, you're selling it as a war film, liberal war film. I said, why don't you start telling people that's a De Palma film first, which is almost disassociated from, the commercial reasoning, you know, the commercial veneer, right. the shape, and they, um, so I, I, and then they'd like, we, we, they're coming, <laughs> they're coming, they're coming back, Chris, because I was there actually going, I, I, I had like a great, great every day, I had a window, and instead of going to see Sheffield, and would do that later, I just went to redacted while it was still in the theater, I like, oh yeah, uh, but, but they were like. <laughs> You know, no, thank you, thank you for that because I think that might. You know, I think people were re- responding to that. <laughs> like, well, I felt, imagine I felt that. Of, so, well, uh, nowadays you'd have to just imagine, but <laughs> that's true. It's very it's true. harder and harder. 
I, I think this is probably a good time to hit on what seems to be the theme of tonight and uh, something that originally brought us together. And that's sadly the just mounting of tragedies and death and, and sadness. Uh, the, the original thing that brought us together is uh, I had Nathaniel Thompson on the channel and in between us recording and posting the interview, Sergio Mims passed away and it just struck me for some reason. And based on that and the feeling on all that good reason, <laughs> It, it led to this uh, it, it led to this memorial that we did for the Shelf Shock Rewind Awards. And it was such a touching tribute to you Kirla. threw there. Yeah. For Kirla, which I thought was beautiful. I thought yeah. if, there was, if there was an award that she deserved, aside from just her accomplishments, right. <laughs> I mean, that, that for me would be my own award. I was I was just very smart. It was very it was very touching that you you picked her to be the first recipient of that because um, I think she really represented everything that Sergio um, just yeah. hoped for with people. Uh, he was a very unselfish character, like I told you. Like all he wanted to do was connect with other filmmakers and right. get them motivated so they could develop their own sense of vision. He, boy, oh boy, was I jealous, but you know, luckily I made up for it because I made friends with uh, Jamal Fanaka uh, when he was on Facebook and you know, he was, he was an AFI darling. I mean, he had two yeah. films when he was in the AFI, you know, schooling system in theaters. I mean, but his films, like what we talk about, they're multiple leveled. Like yeah. you would be, you would think, that's Sergio for what, you know, he did for uh, black filmmakers in Chicago or internationally, ultimately, but it was right. fest the two festivals. He was, uh, you know, uh, f you know, helped form um, and the schooling in Chicago for black filmmakers. It wasn't just for black filmmakers, for someone who could appreciate what's needed in his own community and look beyond that without bias and without, um, I mean, he could still be an activist and understand right. what needs activation without any sense of, uh, well, how would I say this? It, he didn't store, um, he didn't store stereo stereotypical preconceptions of other races or cultures. He treated everybody like a human being. And, uh, I, you know, I can't, um, he just cared about movies. He cared about people who could, uh, who had something to articulate. Um, and it was funny that he ended up, I think, working as like an assistant director for Jamal Fernaka yeah. on the penitentiary. Uh, he was exactly the same way. I got a call from him. I just knew him, you know, pretty actively on Facebook. He called me and he said, I'm being honored at, the, I think it was, God, was it UCLA or USC? I can't remember. It was a long time ago. And he, he said, do you want to come down? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's no, there is no, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say it's colorblind, but it's certainly individual blind. I mean, he, right. they, they cared about people. And, the, you know, to me, that's, you know, it's what I, you know, I grew up called a mensch, you know, as a, a, a human being, you know, a person. Um, and he's, so, um, I don't know if a lot of us are as naturally um, ordained that way, you know. And I, so he was, he was certainly someone I would, the, the, you know, you hear a role model, a little phrase, the role model. Yeah. He really is someone to uh, sort of live up to that, you know, hit the standards. And I just thought, wow, that you guys were, would consider him for that was galvanized. I mean, you hurt. I almost cried six times doing that thing. I'm, I'm almost doing it right now. There's. I mean, but but there's a reason why. It's not, it, it, it was so, it was just so appropriate. Right. And I was just so happy that, you know, feel bad he didn't know what his because yeah. he didn't he didn't even say that he was terribly sick you know i, I finally met him in person at the uh, a, the uh, tcm festival when he came and he, he introduced the slender thread i think and uh, uh lilies of the field 
Um, and it was like, I don't know, like we had been lifelong friends in person yeah. and no indication he had a cane walking with a cane, never said anything. No, no, nothing about, you know, dealing with cancer, nothing. And, um, the day I found out that he passed away, I really, it, it was as bad as when, you know, my, my mom and my dad passed away. Uh, my grandma who were, were all pathetically close to me, you know, I mean, like that's, that's how, I mean, it's, it, you know, it, it's not, it's not, I wasn't, I'm not, people aren't privileged like that. And Sergio was someone who, you know, you know, it's like, I'll go and I'll watch, I'll go look at, you know, Facebook, you'll have like your, this date five years ago. <laughs> and there'll be something that Sergio had posted on my wall, like a, a thing that me and Nate had done, a, a commentary or something, or just saying, you know, this is, this was, yeah. this was one of the best, or loved your Charlie Varick, you know, vid essay, one of the best, one of the very best that I've ever, did, you know, you have to tell me how to do that one day. I'm like, oh, come on, you know, really, that kind of thing, where that he was just encouraging. And that yep. was him. It was no act. It was no, and just to look back at his accomplishments, you know, my God, it was just mind blowing. And he and did some great. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that's, it's the thing that it, it is him as a person that you can embrace now. And I'm sure I'm not the only one, but the, the, the moment that the word came out, I started just ingesting every single thing that he had done again. And oh, good. Uh, the, the, the probably 60 days following that listening to great interviews, to commentaries, to things that, you know, thank goodness that he was alive during the internet and we have his voice <sighs> captured in so many places. And I, I could just hear that same consideration and complimentary attitude about every single thing that he ever laid eyes on. It oh, was I'm really glad to hear this. You have no idea. It's, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, he's, He's a liberating soul. I mean, he really does. Um, he does have that effect. He's, he's very smart. You know, I know, I know. I and mean, it's, 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 this was a hard, and this particular year, I mean, you know, every, you know it's a life. We're all going to go, you know, what can you do? And then some of us will be blessed in how we go and some will not. And, yeah. uh, but it, 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 in the meantime, it is, it is very sad. I lost, you know, in the last, while I was doing my work, see, this is weird when I'm doing this work, it's terrible because it's always the most distracting thing. I had, um, two funerals, huh? I had two funerals <laughs> to have to go through while deadlines had to be pushed right? because, and I'm like, you know, I mean, what, 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 what can you do? You know, I have to organize, I had to organize one. Yeah. Um, and it was just a, a nightmare. Five, five close friends, and then you have your influences or, you, you know, people like Treat Williams and you take it for granted because you don't think they're going to go. Yeah. So when they go, you start to go, oh, God, my heart is just an excavation site now. You know, where did yeah. that go? Um, you know, you know, plus, you know, silly thing. I don't think it is my I. I love my dogs. Like they're, they're my life. They're, they're, they're yeah. there for me. Why, you know, I mean, and they're not just like cute little, you know, <laughs> they're not objects <laughs> that I own. They're, right. they're, they're my they're family, family, they're close family. And they, you know, forget they don't, thank goodness they don't talk, but they don't speak English, <laughs> but they, um, you know, I've had to deal with the past years. My, my oldest dog, Osa, she's a, Norwegian Buhut, who's like this beautiful, sweet, selfless creature. Like all she yeah. does, she doesn't, she has, she just wants to, she just cares about you. It's it. No, you know, so it's hard to yell at her to like, stop barking. You know, you're going to get us. She's, she's a beautiful, but she tore both ACL oh, gosh. ligaments in her in hind knees. And she's, we've been go for a year. We've been going and doing the physical therapy and acupuncture and underwear and arthritis is setting it. And I'm just fighting, you know, I can only do so many of these jobs to pay for her, therapy, right. you know, and I'm trying to, that's, that's really almost what it's, what it's become. But th there is no, there is no better to, 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 to care. It's so much better state to be in than not to care. And I right. don't, I, 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 I'm, I'm really touched and, 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 and I, and I, in a in a an unusual way that you guys really did that, uh, and also like I say, 
for someone like Kirla, you know, it was beyond, it was beyond um, a, a perfect, a perfect example of what that award should stand for. Yeah. Um, you know, awards now, they're basically now, you know, you, you get these like, uh, what is it like a popularity contest type of thing. Yeah. And yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. That's good. You get an indication of what, you know, the majority of people are lucky, you know, enough to, to see, you know, but I think someone like Kirla is, I mean, that's very rare when you have someone, and then you have someone equally rare like Dave Gregory, who's in the best way possible enabling her. Yep. <laughs> and, Worldwide, uh, literally. Yeah. But, but again, I can see through his eyes on that. And it's just like, yeah. you know, you thank your lucky stars, you get someone like that. She's genuinely um, sculpting um, uh, this whole new, uh, again, it's not academic, but there's elements of that, depending on who she's uh, dealing with, this wonderful international network of, of, of brains that have something to say that no one else thinks of or knows how to say. And, and it's, it's treated with, by you guys, not just with respect, but honest affection. And it, it, that was, you know, again, that's, that's why I, I end up crying during, <laughs> during the, the announce, you know, my, the announcement for it. I was very touched that, you know, even Nathaniel had suggested that because, um, I, you know, Sergio meant so much, but the fact that to you guys, he didn't just mean so much as a person, but he meant so much, uh, like how I examine movies on, on yeah. other levels. Uh, you, you got it. Uh, you got it right. And I think that just means, it means so much. It's not just by rote or a publicity thing. Um, it's definitely something which I think, you know, um, it, 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 you need something, you need a focus like that. Um, not just for, I, I hate calling it accomplishment right. because it makes it sound like other, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the feeling it's, it's to say it out loud, but it's, it's sort of like, I, I will forever associate her with that award like that. And that's what you, that's what you want. I mean, yeah. when there was a time growing up, you know, you got a best actor award. You go, well, that meant something, but not when there's 15, <laughs> I mean, you know, and there, I mean, it's just so I, I, there's no rhyme or reason to, uh, to, to an award anymore. Right. Uh, especially one that, you know, the Academy, you know, it's for Academy members. If you're not an academy member you're not going to get the award right so you understand the parameters and the limitations but it's sort of like in the past i think the last the last oscars i watched was maybe 30 years ago you know i think it, i think it, i watched it only to see if tarantino was gonna win the award you know but <laughs> it started to just kind of per, be perverted you know um yeah. you know when you start cutting out your technical awards and things like that you, you have a, a glimpse of the battle this commercial battle and, and you don't know what the why the awards are being given anymore, but in, you know back in the '60s and the '70s when things were it was like the sort of the wild, creative wild west out there, you could really go like you know, holy shit, there's Apocalypse Now fighting for Best Picture next, next to Ordinary People. How are they going to parse this one? That's interesting, you know, things like that. So it just started to change for me. It, it started to change. I'm not saying for everyone was going to completely agree, get that. Yeah. But. And I, I, I really wanted to bring up the awards, not even for the awards aspect, but the, the necessary memorialization that we are doing for some of these people. And that's to, to bring it back to you, like the, the interviews that you've done, the documentaries that you've done, the, uh, the context and personal history behind these is what makes this have substance. I mean, there's, there's so many people you brought up just a minute ago that we're losing our influences and I'm of a younger generation. And so I've witnessed my, my influences losing their influences. And now we're at the point where we're, we're losing major influences like multiple times a week right now. And yeah. it's, going to get worse and if we don't have physical media capturing the voices of some of these people we're never going to hear the context behind these we're never going to hear Ooh. their, well, their personal the opinions. yeah it was michael tuckner good deal <laughs> <laughs> how come i'm not on that one right, anyway. i cool. yeah i i'm just we, but, uh, we, you're right we just lost barry newman yeah you know i i, I, and I you know treat I mean, this week yeah 
Barry Newman is. Have you ever seen the, the? You'll get a chance to see the lawyer if you never saw the liar in the Sydney Fury box set. Yeah, um, that is. I mean, I, you know, it's in, inconceivable. Some of these, but yeah. and that's just not a character that he creates and he shows up and just like I said, he has to become someone that the the director is also envisioning. And right. that's when you you notice that this guy's going a little bit beyond where uh, most actors either know to do or are allowed to do or encouraged to do. It's one of those rare these rare moments. And Barry Newman was one of these guys. And again, you know, I sit there and I'll weep. When when Richard Klein passed away, um, I, I I was a I was a basket case for yeah. for a long time. I, I, you know, it was like suddenly that was not that. That was not like, Tuesdays and Thursdays weren't going to happen anymore, and uh, uh, and, I, and 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 what was bad was that there was a t- that time I had to go back to the East Coast to deal with my pa- my my dad. My mom had already passed away before, but my dad was now with Alzheimer's. Um, he had to be moved to a home, and we you know so I had to I had like a certain amount of time to clear out. 50 years of the family home alone right. with ghosts from the family, let alone other things. And, um, so it, it, you know, then I got back and, and Richard passed away and that was, you know, I felt like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't there, you know, I, I just took it for granted in a way. I mean, not that I had, I've been seeing him up to the point where I had to go back, but he was the kind of guy he, he, he sent me, um, the morning, his cat, snowflake he had a cat beautiful white cat and it passed away um and he texted me in the, in the morning that snowflake passed away and i was like i'm like sitting there going like oh man you know and, and he's confiding to me i mean like this right. guy taught me everything that one you know was one of one of those formative voices for me and i was just lucky enough you know to to get to know him on a, a personal level too but that was again a, a kicker for me because he was human too you know and i so that 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 got me same thing with sergio is like these pe- cer- certain people um i you know um uh, th- they really did really get it and i, I think it's good it's good to cry you don't cry <laughs> but it's, but it, 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 it it's just weird to think that that uh, that you can get such an emotional connection like the treat williams thing you know um yeah i get it he was not just you know in a couple of movies that people loved yeah he also backed it up by being a good guy <laughs> it's like oh yeah i don't i don't recall hearing horrible stories about treat williams he was a good, generous guy brought people with him treated them res- with respect uh treated things without uh you know um uh what's the word you know uh, he didn't he didn't look down on the films that he made yep. he chose you know he, he trusted the films that were given to him and he did his best and he was really good you know but you start to care when they're not there anymore because that's like you know oh wow you know gone and they they're gone it's hard to it's hard to to get it movies they that's the one thing about film which is sad is that you know you're introduced to another world and then you realize that it's a world that's created by people yeah. and then if you really get like into it which people we're talking of our audiences do you know you start to really there you have know, films reflect not just your interest but your imagination and you start to care about the people who provided you with these opportunities uh to to just think and live somewhere else maybe that you liked and you know so i understand like you know when a, you know a director like De Palma makes a movie that they wouldn't have you know, he shouldn't right. have done that movie nah well maybe you shouldn't have gone to see it <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> but but i understand how you can feel that way because in your mind i mean if you've ever seen that that movie um room 237 about the shining which isn't yeah. it's not about the shining it's about the relationship audiences it, yeah. have with what they watch and what they bring to it so that's why one of the reasons why i thought that was a, a great movie because the only thing it's just using the shining as like an excuse but it does show how people 
have things, have, have great perceptions to bring. And you can't help it. Some people don't get that. And that's fine, because the, really the medium wasn't meant to do anything but entertain and make money. But when there's something behind it, you start to care about the, the person who did this for you. Yeah, right. and you can't help it. So it becomes poignant. So I, I really do, uh, that's why I love the arts, and I love people who respond to it in different ways, different levels, even academic. I mean, I, I get it. It's It's when they say I love movies some people really do I used to have a great argument all the time with Roger Ebert that he doesn't give a fuck about movies at all he really hate I said you wouldn't have two books called I hate movie you know I hate this movie you, you, you wouldn't have dog of the week if you're if you didn't want to create some kind of moral gimmick that doesn't right. really exist on any plane um, because you're you're doing you what you are supposedly you know and he goes I'm I'm just supposed to give a thumbs up and thumbs down. And I go, well, I don't have to respect you. <laughs> Way to reduce that. <laughs> I can like, I can like your work, yeah. you know? Um, but you know, certain things I think are certain hypocrisies. I just like, you know, when you're, you know, when you, when you're toying with people's perceptions, you're also toying with other people's careers. And I know a few people back in the day who, when Siskel and Ebert gave a dog of the week, that was the end. And nobody wants to admit that. They want to think of yeah. it. It did. And they were told. You know, so. Yikes. I have my, I mean, but that's the, a critic, that's the job. Right. You know, uh, and that's why, you know, even Sergio, I would tell him, I go, I hope you're gonna, not going to say that in my presence, you know, about this movie. <laughs> I said, you're entitled. Everyone's entitled. I'm entitled. Everyone's entitled to feel so. But, um, you know that that to me it's sort of like you know you're, you're talking about yourself you know and if you if you really are this person with a, such an open heart and such a um it's a it's a to me it's sort of an unfortunate aspect to human nature which everybody it's it's with it's everybody right. it has nothing to do with singling out anyone you know but um but yeah i mean and it's it, you're i mean you're right i mean you're you're right to feel this way this year in particular we've actors or directors yeah uh we've lost musicians especially i mean comic book art i mean comic book artists god I mean, every which way um life just goes on but it's really it it's it, 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 for, for for me i'm sitting there and i'm trying to get all these projects done and you know not get fired and just get it done and please people and all i'm doing is like i have to do this like Maybe I have an hour while while the guests are, you know, uh, you know, when when they're out getting the food for the guests for the funeral, you know, afterwards I can go and get get the scene done, you know, cut. And right. this, this happened when you know just recently, I, I, a couple of years ago, I had uh, a thing with my um, I have food bad bad food poisoning, but I also threw up for forty hours, mm. and this was after like maybe every couple of years something would trigger this you know um and i have and i went to the, the the doctor and he's like okay well that's cedars and he's like okay well you know this is uh, the very worst damage to an esophagus i've ever had to deal with this is you know we rate them on like you know a b c d you would be like a, a d minus and so I'm like, and I couldn't at the time after this happened, I couldn't even swallow. Like I tried to swallow a thin sheet, tasted good, a thin sheet of deli ham, <laughs> almost choked to death. Oh, I, in, in my car, I, it couldn't, there, there was a stricture. So why? So I was in the hospital editing the play Misty for me. The hour and twenty minute, hour and 20 play, minute thing. play Misty from this feature length vid essay on Play Misty for me on the for Kino. And I'm and I'm in the hospital. I'm in the hospital. I'm like, oh, okay. And this is so this this has happened a couple of times. This is this is really you know, you, you start to you that's why I now I because I think I've had this like sort of like an extended brush with mortality and then you right. know carrying my, my my niece my nieces my my nephew my my sisters you know uh yeah yeah what are they gonna do if i you know you know 
oh, I won't see them for sure, but you know, I, I can't, you know, I can only hope that they would miss me a little bit, you know, right. but, um, I don't know if anyone who listens to my commentaries would miss me, <laughs> but <laughs> that's, you know, that's part of part for the course. Well, on that note, if I could emulate Sergio for a moment to, to bring a close to this topic before I lead into one final thing and I, I give you your Wednesday night back, uh, in in sort of reverence of something that you just said a moment ago, I'd like to hijack uh, something you said and and give uh, some feedback and say, in honor of Sergio, thank you for the perseverance through the year that you've had, for the perseverance through the life experiences that you had. And one of the things that you just mentioned a moment ago is one of the things that has always hit me about your work, and that is creating this world that you are visualizing for somebody else that we can realize is not real. Like when we're watching a film and for somebody like me that didn't have the, the privilege and honor of growing up in a family where they could feel accepted like you or could feel influenced by film in the way that you were, you are delivering that to another generation. And I'm so grateful for what you've done. Uh, ditto. It's, and you do, and, but I, I appreciate that. And I really do. And, and it's the same thing. I mean, you should feel the same way about what you're doing. It's, it's, a, it's, it's reflexive. I mean, so I, you know, again, you're saying that about, and I appreciate it, but I really do feel that way about you. And I, I think, you know, um, I, I mean, and it shows, I mean, my, a lot of my colleagues who, who have been here, um, they they feel uh, uh, they 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 think that they they know they they're they're feeling like they're in, uh, finally in touch with um, what they're hoping for you know the not just you know people listening to what they're saying but also um, you, uh, another friend that is now yeah. made so it's it's like this is in 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 things that deal with language that was created by human beings. And manipulated by human beings it's also nice to know that there's people out there who will give all sorts of these meanings and, and these different people a chance to try and understand them on, on their for yeah. their own merits not for the ones you expect from them so you know i always i always tell people like if you know um you know i i I, I would love you to watch this movie, but I hope you accept it on its own terms and not the ones that you're creating for it. Right. You know, I mean, I, it's, it, and it's not an easy thing, but I, I really do appreciate, you know, what, what you say. I would appreciate what you do. It's hard when you're, it's being told to you when you're definitely not used to hearing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, but I, no, but I, I really do. I, I appreciate it. And, I, and you know, it's just, it's, it's great. It's great that you consider, you know, some all these people who are doing it because you know we we want we're definitely not all the same, but we're we're you know we're, we we feel fortunate that you know at least right. for now p people you know want us to, to to keep doing it, you know, but uh, but thank you. I mean, that's I, I, and again, I really appreciate that. I am happy to deliver it and uh, to try to end on a little lighter note, if I could uh, sort of lightning round some questions at you and just get a real short answer for sure. some things that are meaningful to you. Sure. Um, New York, what, what is the first film that comes to mind when you think of Long Island? It's silly. Luna. <laughs> Bertolucci's Luna. How about... I was, uh, I was turned away. I was turned away with my dad. We went to. We wanted to have a, a bonding. We went to go see Apocalypse Now at the uh, the largest screen on Long Island. At the point is the Syosset Theater. It's like an hour, a forty five minute hour drive on a Sunday morning. He just wanted to go. He didn't care. He just wanted to be. Right. That was his dad. And we were turned away. It was sold out. The line was for like the next three showings wrapped up. So we went across the street to the the Cinema One Hundred and Fifty, where it was a curved screen. We saw Bertolucci's Luna, and that was like religious experience. So we we shared that. So that's that, that's why that's the, that's the first thing I think of because that was an excursion, a Sunday morning excursion, sort of impromptu. And we were so strange, but how about now for uh, L.A.? Oh, what, what's the what's the film that comes to mind for L.A.? Oh, it's a mad, 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 mad world. <laughs> nice. Um, which how which about, is lifelong, yeah. Uh, how about what film did you not get to see? Oh, actually, open... let, I'm sorry. Yo, you're good. Go ahead. John Landis's Susan's Plan. If you have to talk about L.A. specifically, 
one of the very best films about LA. It, it, uh, it, a disturbing. It's like watching a. It's like watching a, 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 a like a daily episode of something like the news on KTLA actually come to life. If you haven't seen that, it's a really. I've not seen that. It sounds incredible. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it, it really is. I mean, I actually told I I couldn't believe Nastasia Kinski. I thought was really brilliant in it, and uh, the film's been derided and mocked for a long time. But um, I actually told I actually was given a moment where I could tell her this over dinner. We had uh, I was invited to um, the Italian uh, film group down in. Uh, uh, Westwood, and they uh, they had a, a little thing afterwards, and Nastasia Kinski was there, and I said, "Well, you know, I got to tell you, it was one of the most difficult parts I could possibly imagine an actress trying to do, and s- such tonal shifts." I said, "I can't." I said, "But I really thought you were you were quite brilliant in that." This was like an hour later. I feel a tug in my shoulder, and she's like. I just wanted to thank you for that. I never heard, and no one ever, I, mean, I didn't even, that's the last film anyone would have noticed me in. And she was, she was really great. But that, that's LA. That's an LA. That's like, welcome. that's like, you know, Alan Rudolph, welcome to LA or liquor sheets. It's at that level of, of unique. John Landis really, you know, I think went somewhere uh, dark without having to, uh, you know, uh, change what Los Angeles is really about. And it's a great movie. It's inherently very dark in L.A. <laughs> uh, what is the film that you did not get to see on opening weekend that you wish you could have? I don't even remember opening weekends, to be honest with you. Um, I you my family usually went when I was when I trusted them with you know what I saw. What about I mean, one before your time, maybe? Oh. It's, that's hard. It is. That's hard. I mean, I've seen so many movies. First of all, yeah. it's like I don't know. Uh, it's a great question. Okay, um, it deserves an answer, but it's it's almost it's like it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. I'm sure there has to be. Oh, um, the Wild Bunch. I would have liked to have seen on opening weekend. I think we saw. Like two, like two or so weeks after my family went, we didn't. It didn't. It didn't come to a theater near us. Um, it was. It was still. It, it, it wasn't. Or it wasn't in the theaters that. Was, but but once I saw it, I was. I remember feeling, you know, and I. I don't even think I was in kindergarten. <laughs> Maybe I was in kindergarten. I, I. I was. I was. I was actually angry that we didn't go and see that first. I, that, hmm. So there, that wild bunch, I can actually say, because we, my mom and I ran to see Cross of Iron when it came out, and that was stupendous. Wow. Ken Russell, I think we've, I think I saw everything, but well, not opening weekend, at least in my mind, it was, you know, Close. in the, in the, yeah, in the, in the, the heyday of, you know, exactly in that like first week or first weekend maybe, but not the first, yeah. but yeah, I was never, I was never opening night oriented. I just wanted to see stuff, you know, so. Definitely. All of my all of my personal answers for that would be just to see the way like the zeitgeist was affected for it. like the original King Kong, just everybody going, what the oh, fuck? Yeah, yeah, right. OK, that's a profound answer. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, gosh, uh, the last thing. And I'm, I'm sorry to put you on the spot like this. OK. Grief and death um, to bring it back to another uh, personal point before we leave. Okay. Is there a film for you that has been personally very comforting that if somebody is going through a year like you've had or like our society has had that you would say, Hey, this is one I've turned to. Maybe it'll help you. Well, um, it's another strange one. And it's an, actually, it's another peck and paw. Um, it would have to be bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia because it's, it's a movie that I, I don't remember seeing a film that emotionally affected me brought me into that character and his reflection on what makes a life, you know, it's, it's, is it, you know, you see so many movies about people going through experience and, and this guy's experience rested only in his heart. Yeah. And, uh, to me, that was that, that's the one I would recommend to people sort of just to put existence into a context. Um, not necessarily one that unfortunately explains it, or 
um, make sense out of it. But I think that's maybe a little bit of the point or one of the points of, of that movie. Uh, yeah. You know, and he's he's always sort of, uh, Peckham was always sort of when, his, when he was coherent, you know, uh, he was, uh, I think his heart ruled. Uh, so all those movies that he made, you know, uh, even the ones like Ballad of Cable Hogue and, and Junior Bonner, um, I, I actually go out of there crying, you know, at the end, like, uh, you know, the baby, ride the high country, I was a weep. And, and, and it's only because he made me believe not just the world, but like what you're saying, I, I, I feel like, I feel like I've lived that character's, you know, experience, that weariness, right. that tenuousness of existence. And, um, it's, you know, um, Mike Siegel, who's like become the master behind, you know, ex- Peck and Pa, you know, and getting him out there to people. Uh, I mean, you, he called his long-term, documentary um passion and poetry and i think that really yeah i mean that I, that gets me you know I, I i get it uh people are f- flawed by design you know not everybody is a, a beauteous individual you know even those that m- maybe we think are you know we don't know everything about everybody but everyone is it's it's a we're a flawed s- specimen and to have people who unashamedly admit that um, we have those flaws, those fractures in our uh, our soul, our morality, or our ethics. Does does that you know? Does that mean we're to be judged by those flaws? Um, and and it's it, it's interesting. I mean, you know, of course, that's that's mainly why I enjoy a lot of these directors who had like a sort of a left wing bent. Yeah, because they they took the time to explore that um, those at those aspects you know judgment you know punishment also um, crime what are the crimes you know what what is a crime that is you know and the fact that they got me to uh, to to feel without necessarily understanding like you know we talk about the doing the kramer piece um a decade his last decade of films is just you know, pretty much hated critically um and there i'm watching it and i'm just realizing well you know here's a guy who with these last movies suddenly changed his whole idea of what the films meant to people to generations um teaching us about injustice teaching us about um the 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 things the terrible things that people do get away with morally, ethically, um, to other people. And here suddenly he's critically out of touch, commercially out of touch. And without hammering his heavy handedness quote, which is critically, you know, what he's assigned his heavy handedness when his, in his heyday, when he was successful, um, showed that people were f- afraid of of this education he was giving people because it made sense and right. some people didn't appreciate that but now you have a director who suddenly changes and after one movie where after a life you know almost a lifetime of you know 35 years 40 years of making an acclaimed uh, emotionally you know these these epics of morality suddenly he's making movies about his confusion as to who he now is who is listening to him why would they listen to him and what is he trying to say all of those movies are predominantly about that confusion especially the domino principle especially runner stumbles runner stumbles you can watch on a superficial level and go all right that's him all right well his the hairstyle isn't quite 1920s (laughs) for dick van dyke but you know I'm watching it and I see that Dick Van Dyke has a very striking physical resemblance to Stanley Kramer. And having talked to, you know, having done a, that interview that's on the Domino Principle disc with uh, his widow, um, Karen Sharp, Karen Kramer, brilliant woman and lovely to talk to, and, you know, very generous with her inside uh, views to her husband. Um, he, according to her, he was someone who 
had to fit the main character with all its flaws, with all its hand and glove. And I could not shake that when I started watching the last decade of his movies, which had all been sort of critically, you know, some of them were truly reviled and then they were, I mean, Domino Principles was reviled. And I, there it is. And I'm like, wow, all these things that were leveled about the film, like, you know, the plot's confusing. They didn't understand it. Hackman's a character. Gene Hackman's a character. Doesn't understand what's going on. He's totally confused. And if he's confused, why aren't, you know, why, how, how, how are they not going to, how come we, we're confused too. We don't. Exactly. Get, and I'm like, well, did you ever think that Stanley Kramer feels like he's a little confused too? You know, the people that are controlling him. Ooh, there's the, there's the social relevancy. It's also uh, pretty much his idea of saying, you know, this is, a, this is the studio doing this. And I've never been asked to cut a half hour out of my movie before. What, you know, what, what is that about? You know, yeah. why am I making this movie now? It's what is this about? Movie. So he's really doing, you know, what I kind of start calling like these bio metaphorical you know, uh, these, these biographical sort of surveys of themselves at the time of making the movie and it's heartbreaking. So that's, you know, that's sort of like what I come out of this with is that, you know, uh, it's, it's a commercial, it's a job and people are hired to make these movies. Uh, You know, not everybody, some are luckier than others, but you know, the ambitions are different. Right. But for a commercial filmmaker and commercial film, their films do exist on on more than one emotional plane, certainly yeah. a biographical plane, subtextual plane, and that in itself, to me, is the achievement: is that they found not just the director, but the director, the happenstance. Sometimes it's brutal, and it it just ruins their lives. It can, you know, uh, but at the same time, my I'm just a viewer, so. I'm, you know, for however long they want to give me with that movie before, during, and after seeing it, um, I'm just an empath, you know, I'm just fig- I'm trying to figure it out, you know, I'm in it for the language and, and for the people that yeah. figure out new ways of using it. So again, I, I can't appreciate what you're doing is so, so great because, you know, uh, you're actually giving people like us, you know, who are the low men in the totem pole, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, we're not all historians, you know, we're right. a lot of the theoricians and things like that. We just have a sort of gut instinct about movies and take it or leave it. But I'm glad that you guys take it, you know, and it's, I really appreciate it. And I, I, I'm hoping that, you know, you also get the chance to, you know, sit in our shoes eventually, because I think you guys, you obviously have an, an awful lot to say, and uh, whatever it is, I'm 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 positive it's it'll come from the heart, and uh, and uh, at least an attempt at using the intellect to to at least you know try and articulate it. So thank you. I think that's the perfect note to call this on. Uh, this has been fascinating, and uh, this is going to be one of those ones that I I'm going to have to go back and listen to myself a few times because yeah, there's it. just yeah, so same. so much intellect in this. I I appreciate you so much. Oh, thanks um, so much, Fred. There is well, then you're doing the next commentary with me. There you go. (laughs) This is how these marriages are born. Let's do it. Uh, There's going to be links to a bunch of Howard's work in the description below, of course. Uh, Howard is on every single one of the box sets (laughs) coming from imprint in July. So buy them all uh, because they're probably going to go a lot quicker than people are ready for. Um, You're on Kino stuff. You've been on... Gosh, uh, you got umbrella stuff coming up. You got all kinds of stuff. What's uh, what's what's one coming up that you're super proud of that's been announced already? Oh, well, all the imprint stuff is is okay. Everybody really gets awesome. the imprint also, stuff hard. Also, I I I predominantly uh, edited um, uh, this thing on the uh, the new Severn box for uh, the comic strip presents. And oh I, yeah, I, I definitely want to do a shout out for that because uh, I certainly wasn't, I had no, this was my inauguration to that show. And I, I, I once again, I would Dave, Gre- Dave Gregory for that experience. Um, I, 
I loved working. I loved working on that. As far as my <laughs> my experience with them, you know, I can only go for when I'm editing for that. I can only go so far as to you know either what's given to me or what I l- literally understand how to handle. So it was a it, that was hard hard for me. I hadn't experienced anything that I was to- totally alien to, right. and uh, the it, 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 there's so much on that uh, box set. Again, it's typical visionary Dave Gregory, you know Severin. I mean, it's like you, you, it's like you don't have to expect it from them anymore. It's just like, what are they going to do? And you just take it, you know, yeah. so many people are blind. <laughs> <It's buying>. overwhelming. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, that, so that, that one, this one episode in particular called Mr. Jolly lives next door with Peter Cook and Rick Mayall and Aid Edmonds. And so, man, uh, I warned you, you know, to don't even have particles <laughs> of food near your mouth during that. I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll end up in the hospital. It is brutal, brutal comedy. Uh, <laughs> unlike most other things, they really had a, 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 their own little stamp. So that, that, and everything is different on that. All the films on that are different. So I, I highly, highly, recommend. I'm kind of proud of that in a way, just by association, um, you know, but, uh, but the, the imprint stuff is, is really been wonderful because they, they, they encourage video essay and they, they do not interfere with um, what you're trying to say. Uh, I'm, I'm sure if, if it was really egregious that they would have a reason to. So I haven't gotten that yet, but, um, but that's great. And, and Daniel Kramer, who put the Fury, the Sydney Fury box set together, yeah. that's from his heart because he was Fury's biographer, but not just that. It's transcended into you know quite a, uh, an emotional relationship between the two. So it, there's something that means a little bit more. And I think Daniel just did a, an extraordinary job, you know, um, sort of coordinating that. That's a, that was a really, that's going to be, this, this series of sets are going to be really fun, um, you know, for sure. And I, and I really, really loved the, uh, the Dick Richards thing too. I think that was an unexpected yeah. treat. Marcher I always thought was like, you know, Oh, I don't understand why people just said it was blah. Like, you know, I know there was like an hour cut out of it, which you can see where, if you watch the movie yeah. lifted, I mean, most of the segment, <laughs> but it, it's really quite, quite a, a, um, quite an amazing film. What he got away with, with PG too, is like, good God. But, um, but I, I, I was allowed to do something on every, you know, he only made basically, not including heat six main features yeah. and they uh, and you know thrust of that piece was i saw them all those i saw all like at least yeah. opening weekend you know got my entire life starting with like Culpepper cattle company and ending with like uh, man woman and yes i went to see man woman and child in theater uh <laughs> R- richard shot it richard klein shot it so i had you know it was like one of those That's things like we talked i talked about it with him because he wasn't so impressed with the uh, his work he thought it was you know but um but he never was um but i th- that i also i thought was really really good to do uh i i feel like i unlocked him you know uh, you read you read reviews and there's just no attempt at uh, giving this guy any kind of a personality but he you you, you look at people like his his uh, uh the, the people he worked with, his his colleagues, were uh, these other commercial directors that made an impact, you know, spicy, spicy meatballs. If you're my age, you go, oh, right. my God. You know, <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. You know, Charmin, you know, don't squeeze the Charmin. I mean, you grew up with this crap. This, these were people like Howard Zeif, who did Slither and ultimately My Girl, you know. Um, and you had Jerry Schatzberg, who, st- you know, did Puzzle of the Downfall yeah, Child yeah. and uh, uh, some really insane, dark, dark films. And they're not known for that. They're known for what people say, oh, it's comedy drama. Blah, blah, blah. And, then you, and then you have Dick Richards. And, and these are far more complicated guys. They, they, they weren't following rules. They were, if anything, they probably looked at Robert Altman and said, yeah, you're you make sense to me, you know, defy, you know? Right. And, um, and I, I, I love that. Um, I do, I, I, I wasn't like this some years ago, but I do feel there's a great hope uh, for cinema, especially in, you know, what's coming out on, you know, Netflix and stuff like that. I mean, you know, I like there, there, a lot of the series that I'm seeing, uh, not everything connects with me, but you know, like certain things really just wowed me lately. Um, 
Vince Gilligan, I just don't understand how someone has a brain like problem. that. And there's tons of dummy deaths in his movies too, yeah. making it even more complex. <laughs> but um, but he, you know, it, so I, I do see. A, a, I didn't see a great future. Uh, now I kind of do. I, I, and when I saw Licorice Pizza, I, I mean, goddamn, is there a happier movie, a happier, darker film than than Licorice Pizza? I was just like, wow, the language is bad. Wes, Wes Anderson, who I despised, you know, stupid bias from days when I was like, oh, I'm not, I don't like, do, do. I, 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 another one. It's just like, how the hell? Brilliant. Everything. I just trust him. I don't care. I don't care whether I find it, whatever. I'm, I shove it all aside, and I'm gonna learn as much as I can. It's a good, 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 good time. I just hope they all last. <laughs> you know, I would agree I don't, there. I don't want them to go away. But thank you <laughs> again. Just, thank you for your time, uh, yep. everybody. Please uh, just look at the links in the description below. There's so much that Howard has done that I will wholeheartedly recommend. And Howard, again, thank you. This has been profound. Yep. Thanks so much. Have Ryan. a great night. Great night. You too. Thanks. Thank you for watching The Disconnected. On the way out, make sure that you are subscribed to the channel, that you've liked the video, and that you've copied the link to be able to share with someone else that may appreciate this.